Good evening and welcome to the 29th meeting for fiscal year 2024 for the Milton Planning Board. Um, at this time, I would like to now call the meeting to order. Uh, we can begin with our administrative items. Um, there was only one set of minutes um, that were that, um, to be approved, but Cheryl is still working on the edits on those. So uh, for tonight, I would uh, have a motion to defer the minutes from two sets of minutes. We have, all right. We also have the other. Um, I'll do those for the next meeting. So the waiving of the minutes uh, for tonight and the dates of the meeting again, Julia, do you have the, um, the ones that were in executive session? Uh, that was um, 26. the 26th. The uh, 26th. Those are before the select board right now. Those are before the select board. So we're going to motion to defer those. But and March 14th and March and March 28th. Okay, and we're just waiting on the edits on those. So if I could have a motion uh, to defer the minutes from uh, 314, 326, and 328. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And then um, the discussion of our next meeting um, dates. Right now we have on the schedule uh, April 24th um, as our last April meeting. And then um, May's meeting uh, would be our regular scheduled unless um, otherwise changed to, do, to have the 9th and the 23rd of May be the following date. The 9th may be uh, town meeting day. Oh, okay. Right? Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Okay. Um, that's <laughs> all right. So let's defer, um, we could possibly meet on the 8th then. Um, me. If members could meet on the 8th. So it would be May 8th and May 23rd at this time. Um, Meredith, just, just a note on that um, and, and our, our meeting next week on the 24th. Yep. Um, that's gonna, we're going to have to be um, fully remote for that meeting next week. Right. Um, MATV will be covering, I believe, the school committee meets on Wednesdays. Yep. Um, I don't have their schedule in front of me. I suspect if they meet on a similar schedule, um, Wednesday um, on the 8th may also potentially be a fully remote uh, meeting. Um, if not, okay. obviously, um, we'll have um, MATV coverage, but we'll, um, we'll keep you all posted um, after checking in with MATV on that. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, so for now, we'll leave it at the 8th, but we may need to yeah, reschedule and then fully remote on the 24th. Um, our next item is um, any update uh, from our Director of Planning and Community Development. Uh, th thank you, Meredith. Um, there, there is an agenda item uh, later on that we're, we're not going to be able to get to, but I can preview for you right now um, relative to the uh, MAPC contract for our East Milton zoning work. Um, I have been talking with Josh Fiala uh, over the last couple of weeks. And um, in order to have enough time to kind of fully execute the scope of that contract, um, FAPC is proposing to, um, Tim, if the board, yeah. yeah. Uh, your micro, you just faded out. All right, I'm going to actually plug my camera in okay. in just a minute, and that should be that. Great. So just give me half a second. Is that better? That's great. All right, wonderful. Um, uh, MAPC is requesting to extend the term of the contracts um, so that they can fully execute uh, the entire scope that we discussed. Um, and the broad outlines that Josh laid out for me was basically um, being able to have a, um, a zoning language deliverable uh, ready for the, the, the original term of the contract. I think it, it, um, it goes like through June, I believe. Um, and that's going to be important for the grant um, that's funding uh, this project to be able to have that deliverable. And then to extend the contract, I believe, to November um, to have enough time to execute on the design guidelines portion um, of the scope. Um, and that will be able to be funded through internal sources. Um, we have other grants um, that don't have a deadline as well as other um, MPIC funds for that. So I think... Um, We'll, we'll talk about it next week. You'll have the language in front of you. Um, my thinking here is that we want to take as much time to do a good job, um, but we'll review um, for next week 
um, that zoning, uh, that, that contract amendment language, um, and we can, uh, we can tag action on that next week. And um, we've got interviews lined up for some promising looking candidates for the assistant director position. Um, those are going to be happening early next week. Um, so hopefully um, there'll be news. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the deadline for the RFP that we put out for consultant services for MBTA community zoning purposes, um, the deadline for that was Monday. So um, it's going to be a really quick turnaround on that. You'll get those probably Tuesday morning from me, um, any responses that we get. Um, we'll have an agenda item for Wednesday. Um, if the board can make a decision, great. Um, if you feel like you need more time or we need to reschedule something, um, that's also fine. Um, but you'll have that stuff in advance of next week's meeting, um, but with a quick turnaround on reviewing it. That's, that's great, Tim. Thank you. Um, and so with that, um, we can now move to our citizen speak. And anyone from the public or on Zoom, Tim, um, if you can let us know and we can invite them to come in. Is there anyone who would like to speak this evening? Hi everyone, Gene Irwin, 120 Highland Street. <clears throat> um, after attending a few years of meetings here, it's apparent to me that um, I think the whole town needs to brush up <clears throat> on our sewer codes. And I've brought them, and if I may just take a couple of minutes, it may save this board several years of hard work in the future. As I've repeated once before, Massachusetts General Laws, Part 1, Title 14, Chapter 83, Section 1, authorization connecting sewers and approval of plans. A city or town may install and maintain in any way therein where sanitary sewers are constructed such connecting sewers within the limits of such way as may be necessary to connect any estate which abuts upon the way. <clears throat> okay, that's the state. The town of Milton, <clears throat> DPW, Public Works, sewer regulation. Public sewer, and these are definitions. And the first definition is shell. And shell, according to the DPW's rules and regulations, means mandatory. A public sewer shall mean a sewer in which all owners of abutting properties have equal rights and is controlled by a governmental agency or public entity. The definition of available sewage. A public sewer shall be considered available when the property upon which a building is situated abuts a street, an easement, or right-of-way in which the public sewer is located. If said building is more than 150 feet from the nearest public sewer. Application may be made in writing to the board to declare public sewer not available. Then it goes on a little bit further. Any drain layer in violating of any provision of these regulations shall, in addition to the general penalties provided by the violations of these regulations in Article 9, forfeit his license. CMR, uh, 360 CMR, Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, 10.007, paragraph 11. The issuance of a permit by the authority shall not relieve the permittee of its obligation to comply with all applicable laws and regulations. I think the state and I think this town is as clear as can be, crystal clear, that <clears throat> properties like the one at 107 Highland and maybe plenty of others cannot attach their sewers to streets that they do not abut. It's crystal clear. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else from the public wishing to speak this time for Citizen Speak? Tim, is there anyone on with their hands up in the on Zoom? There is not. Do you see no there's not? Okay. No. All right. 
Nope. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, then with that, um, we can now move to open, opening the public hearing at 111 Highland Street Special Permit, continued from April 9th. Welcome, Ned, to the table. Good evening. <clears throat> For the record, Ned Corcoran, uh, on behalf of Northbridge oh. Communities LLC, who's the applicant in this case. Um, I think you may have forgotten to introduce yourselves at the start I'm of the I'm sorry, we did. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you. You know what? We'll do that real quickly. Jim Davis member. Maggie. Maggie Oldfield member. Sean Fahey member. Cheryl Tagaya, secretary. And Meredith Hall serving as chair and our staff with us this evening. Julia. And on Zoom. Tim? Uh, Tim Zerwinski, director of planning and community development. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, just want to make sure that I can, that I can be properly heard. Is that got to be better bringing it closer? Yes, okay. that's better. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Um, I know that we have had a long and robust set of hearings and <laughs> meetings relative to the memory care proposal. I think the last thing that we may need to present would be updates to the landscape plan. And I've got Sashi Meisner available to uh, log in. Or she's, she's on the Zoom and she can share screen and go through the latest plans that we filed. And I think that's, that may be it from our end. Um, we'll look forward to getting into a discussion about the proposed uh, special permit conditions that would be um, imposed with respect to that. Um, if there's anything else that you obviously want us to address, please let us know and we'll make sure we do that. Um, we'd like to be obviously as complete and thorough as possible, understanding that we have um, we've set a deadline for uh, closing this hearing and, uh, for next week. So. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. If you want to bring Sashi, is she on? She's on Zoom. All of our okay. team is on Zoom. Okay. Um, Great. So there she is. Yeah. And <clears> if <throat> she can share screen, um, we can walk through plans and maybe we could dim the lights in front of the screen. If that would be helpful. Yeah. Is that on that side? Hi, everyone. Sashi Meisner, uh, landscape architect for the project. Uh, as Ned said, um, we are presenting the plans that we um, have updated a couple of weeks ago based off of comments that we heard from the planning board and the community members. Um, so I'll just walk you through some of those changes quickly. And uh, I've been on the last two planning board meetings just listening in. So there's a couple of things I can respond to that I've heard in the discussion that uh, we can clear up. So, and then if there's any questions after that, we can um, respond to those. So um, some of the things that we've done in response to comments are uh, increasing the plantings at the rear of the property. So we've added some evergreen trees along with the deciduous trees and um, increased that buffer. There was some comments about that. In addition, we also have um, I believe it's 50 feet of uh, woodlands that are not being disturbed between the property line, uh, between our property line and the um, plantings. So we, we feel that this is a pretty good um, buffer that we have, oh shoot, <laughs> that we have going there. Uh, so that was one thing. We, um, on the plans, one thing that I feel was not super clear on my plans is um, coordination with our environmental consultant. So um, there were a lot of plants not shown on my plan that are on, uh, that were represented on the civil engineering's plan because they were part of the wetland replication as well as um, mitigating some of the invasive plant material on the site. So um, I now updated my plant planting plan to show those plants. And you can see where um, previously we hadn't had, we just had a space open for this, but I really. We just lost you. Sashi, we just lost you. She's lost us. She wanted 12 oh. trees. Sashi, uh, Sashi, yep. we just yep. missed you for the last 30 seconds. 
I'm not sure what happened. Okay. So, so you were just I, getting I was just it, you were just getting started on the planting plan within the wetland replication area. And, yeah. and can I can I can I just say um, we did not lose Sashi on the Zoom, so I don't know if that's something in the room. Um, I heard everywhere she said. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Strange. So I'll just go back a little bit. Um, really, we wanted to show we wanted to we had to coordinate our plans with the environmental consultant. So he had done some. Uh, proposed some plantings on site to uh, reestablish wetlands that were disturbed due to the roadway, uh, the entrance drive going in. And then he had um, had some uh, plans to add additional plantings where invasive plant material is and where we were removing some of that and replanting. So um, I updated my planting plan to show that, and I feel like it really uh, reflects more of the the quantity of plants that are going into this site. Uh, so we have we have a new wetland that's being replicated here. Additionally, there there are some plantings that are going into the wetlands that have been approved, uh, and these are part of the removal of the uh, invasive plant material and then reestablishing native plants that will. Uh, be better for the ecosystem in this area. So a lot of these plantings along this side are in response to that. Additionally, outside of the wetland area, we um, added plants. We added a lot of evergreen trees, uh, a lot of deciduous trees, native plant material um, that are, will be beneficial for the uh, ecosystem, the wetlands, and for screening. So um, I just want to make sure that that was clear. There is a 25-foot no-disturb buffer zone around the wetland, and this can all be planted. So the more plants that go in adjacent to the wetland, the better for the wetland. Um, so we have additional room that we have added more plant material along this side within the buffer that is completely beneficial to the wetland as well as providing additional screening for the uh, for views through the already established woodland area. Um, additionally, we uh, decreased the height of the um, street of the uh, the lights, the pole lights along the driveway. So uh, the request was redu to reduce those. And we did, we re reduced them from 16 feet to 14 feet. We're still able to get the um, light foot candles uh, that are required along the um, ground plane. And so there, there's adequate light, um, but the, the, um, the views into the site, you can see when I show the renderings that it's a little bit more residential in scale. Um, I'm gonna just show, so we updated our rendering. So one of the requests was to create a more residential style entrance. A lot of the entrances to some of the larger residences along this roadway have um, nice stone, uh, stone walls that kind of emphasize the entrance. So we did add some of those along the entrance. And I think this is a, really improves the, the look and the feel of the space. We had requests for showing plant material at a younger, um, younger growth. And so this, this is an attempt at doing that. We decreased a lot of the sizes. The difficult thing with these images is to it's very difficult to reflect what's actually out there. And there is quite a bit of plant material out there, a lot of established trees that will be staying. So, um, but this is, we've reduced some of the size, sizes. We provided a vantage from coming down the road and showing the view in from entering the site from the, the direction of the hospital. We also have a summer view, which obviously will be much more screened due to the leaf uh, leaves being out. But um, you can see the roof line from from this vantage point. 
we updated the plant material in the circle. We um, reduced the amount of trees in here and added one kind of focal tree, um, a tulip tree, and that was recommended. We added more buffering along this side of the, um, within the uh, buffer area. And then we added, um, we changed a few of these plant material, uh, the few of the trees along the side of the building because we, when the, the footprint of the building shrunk, we had additional room to plant so we could get some larger um, trees in here. And this also shows the updated windows uh, on the building. This is a view, you know, right up the driveway. So if you're standing here or walking, this would be the vantage point, or if you're across the street. Here you can see the um, reduced scale of the light poles, which is definitely an improvement. And you can see the way that the, um, the sign, this is still in, you know, it's still in design. This is not complete, but this is kind of what they were thinking of. And uh, having these cur curved walls and natural stone that kind of just, uh, you know, sets off the tone of this of the residential side of this site um, and creates a nice entrance. Here is the view in summer. Um, obviously, getting the actual plant material that's on site is has been um, challenging. We do have some locations, but we don't have a lot of the locations within the wetlands where there are quite a few um, trees. We were asked to do a section um, through the entrance drive showing where we, where we would be planting and the size of the, the plant material within the first five years of growth and then trying to, you know, I just used some images from the site. So looking out towards the road, uh, showing some of the plant material at, um, I think these were between 12 and 15 feet height and some of the shrub plant material that these are taken from uh, one section and one representation of where this section would look like uh, crossing through. And then I have the photometric plan, which I think you've already seen in our submission. Um, I did want to mention that uh, at the last meeting, um, I heard, uh, I believe it was Maggie had mentioned how um, it was unfortunate that a lot of the four inch um, caliber trees were being removed uh, because they provide a lot of the screening for the actual site because of their being, um, their canopies are much lower and are kind of level with your eye. And I was just wanting to uh, say how many new trees we are planting that are that height. And so we, I feel with this planting plan that we have established, I think there's uh, 183 trees that will be either four inch in caliber or greater than seven foot height. Those new plant plants in this space will provide a lot of that understory level um, screening that I think there was concern that some of these were, were being removed. Um, we're adding back quite a few in there. So um, that seems like a, a positive in, uh, in, my, in my view. So uh, that's, all I have, I'm happy to take questions and I'll go back to the plan in case there's any anything people want to reference off of this. Questions <clears throat> from the board on this planning plan? So if you have a question on the photometric plan, the I went um, to the cut sheets that were provided to us at the beginning of this application and I saw a um, sort of a building wall mount or wall pack fixture, but I didn't see where it is on the photometric plan. Um, and I was wondering if it's accounted for in the or, in that photometric plan and where those are planned to be used. Some of those might be um, down lights in, in the canopy. 
I saw that <laughs> there's one that's got a building, um, I call it a wall mount versus the ceiling mounts. Um, and maybe it's in the loading area, so it's not going to be used very frequently. But the, uh, so all of the sort of building level lighting is either bollard or recessed. Is that right? I didn't see others. Oh, the, you're looking at the B1 and B2? I'm not sure which ones are B1 and B2 because I saw the fixture in the mm -hmm. cut sheet, but not on this photometric plan. So maybe that fixture is no longer being used or uh, the you know, we, plan doesn't I, for it, it would not be used. Um, okay. Those we haven't resubmitted the fixtures because we we're using the same fixtures. If there's one that's not accounted for on this plan, then it's not in the site. Okay. Uh, anymore. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Question. Yeah. <clears throat> Sashi, could you go back to your rendering, showing us the view up the entrance drive? Thank you. Can you? Can you? Um, briefly describe the retaining walls once you get past the natural stone um, if you would please and so this is what yeah. has been described as the ready rock yes yeah so with the um, stone uh, facing on I mean not natural stone but it's the ready rock finishes which it hasn't been selected yet um, but it would be one of them with the, um, the texture of a stone. Okay. Texture and color. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We would draw off of what the stone that gets used for the walls and, uh, try to coordinate that with the, the coloring that goes into these ready rock walls. Okay. So there'll be, there'll be an intention to match as best you can a ready Definitely. rock wall to the natural Definitely. rock. Okay. And, and as that wall reaches um, the end of the drive and, and opening up into the circle, the wall on the plan indicates a radius. Is it really a radius or is it a segmented wall? I think uh, I'm wondering whether Paul Avery should answer that question. I'm not sure that if you can answer it, great, Sashi, but if not, we can punt that over to Paul. Sashi, can you go up to the area that I'm referring to? Bring us up the rendering. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, that would be a Paul response. I believe it, 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 I believe it is a radius um, because there were, we had discussions about um, altering some of the layout to, to accommodate the uh, radius that this wall can do. I'm not sure what the difference is from what your question is, a segmental, segmented wall versus a radius? Well, I guess my question is if ready rock is just a, a you know, a rectangular shaped block, mm -hmm. it won't look like a radius unless it's cast as a radius to the radius that you show on the okay. plan. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if they have, um, they have, I know they have certain limitations with the radius that they can go because that was discussed. Um, and I'm assuming that these radii are, uh, you know, pretty standard uh, parts. Okay. So, but I, I don't know for sure, but my, my gut is telling me that it's a radius and that it's, it was dictated by what Ready Rock has available and what they're capable of doing because they would want them to fit extremely tight and, uh, it would be difficult to do that if it didn't have an actual radius to it. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Related, I do have a question related to that wall as well. Um, uh, if we, Sasha, if you can go back to one that shows from the street. 
And the, um, the section showed as if the wall construction is the same on both sides of the roadway. The plan <coughs> indicates a different graphic. So I just wanted to ask Paul if, um, if the graphic inconsistency is just, is not significant, and that it's actually proposed to be the same wall. C301 is the plan that I'm looking at. So it shows as if the wall type is different on the right side of this image uh, compared to the left side of this image. Um, Tim, I'm not sure if Paul is in the um, Zoom or not. I, saw I do know that the wall on the right is different in that it's lower. It's more flush with the finish grade of the entrance drive, and we have the fence along that side. Okay. The wall on the left. Hi. You want oh. me to talk about the wall? I couldn't speak earlier because I wasn't a panelist. I'd raised my hand. But uh, um, <clears throat> so the, the ready walk walls, what I understand is, is that the blocks themselves are not curved, but they can set them at, you know, to make certain radii. <clears throat> um, the wall on the left and the wall on the right, looking at this thing, are different. Um, the wall, the side, and look, this on the entering on the left, that there's a parapet wall that sticks up, whereas on the right, it's flush, and we have the guardrail and the sight fence along the, um, along the sidewalk. And that's what's shown on the on the sections on C, um, whatever it is. <clears throat> it's one of the detail sheets. Yeah, that that's the same thing. Okay, so we've got the parapet on. This is now looking towards the street, so it's the opposite way. <clears throat> There's the parapet on the right as you're heading towards Highland Street. And then we have the different detail on the left. And all of this was done to just minimize the width of the corridor and therefore minimize wetlands impacts and that type of thing. So the, the block finish is intended to be the same on, the, on both sides all the way to, to the street? Or is there a point at which it, it stops being this type of wall on the, um, on the side, the north side, I think? The, the finish for the walls is um, what's shown on the section. There's a photograph of the proposed finish <clears throat> on sheet. And what is it? Let me, give me a second. I can call it up. But um, yeah, give me a minute. Uh, it is sheet 505. If you want me to share screen, I can call it up. Yes, please. <clears throat> can you see that? Yes. Okay. So, so this is what's, you know, the ledge stone texture. This is what's proposed. <clears throat> and in this photograph, you're seeing, you know, how it, how it bends to form curves. And then the section here is the same as exactly what Sashi had on the screen uh, a moment ago. When Sashi said that that wall on the north side is lower mm -hmm. and closer to grade, uh, how long, yep. how far is it that way before it's really necessary to use this type of block? Um, I'm sorry, can you re repeat the question? Yeah, so can you go to C301? Sure. <clears throat> so where, where it's hatched in gray, this is the parapet detail. And where it isn't is, is the top of the wall is flush and we've got the sight fence and the retaining wall. 
All right, so the top of wall there is 121, the bottom is 118, so you have three feet. So you don't really need ready block for a three foot high retaining wall, correct? Um, what we're I'm trying sure to we, understand we, we, we is- could, We could do it with other materials. We looked at, um, <clears throat> we, we looked at a number of different configurations for the entrance wall here and, uh, and uh, went with this particular plan, but I mean, there are a number of different wall products. You know, the design we're just you know keeping it simple and continuing the the um, the ready rock wall until basically the amount of retaining that we need to do is small enough that it just becomes part of the landscape wall. Yeah, we're we're concerned. So that's that's about three feet here. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we've talked about uh, that entrance, and so what we want to understand is. Um, you know, how much of that really is required to be ready rock and how much can be part of that uh, image that Sashi showed with, with more of a stone wall tied to those curves. Uh, because <clears throat> we're, we're looking at what this looks like from Highland in terms of being of the aesthetic. The ready rock is, um, is not, I would say, on par with the stone. Yeah. And so as far down we can get the ready rock and have the stone extend further, the visual would be better. The aesthetic of the entrance would be better, in I, my view anyway. So, so what we're looking at here is a, is a fairly steep embankment. Um, so, you know, right at this particular point, we're ending the wall, we're at, you know, top of 121, bottom 118, um, you know, that drops off fairly quickly. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think we'd be able to go another 20 feet with the landscape wall before, you know, and, and further the road is rising up. <clears throat> so the real reveal on the wall increases rapidly. We could get a little bit more distance out of it, but I don't think like we could go, you know, to the crossing or anything like that. Well, another th thing to think about is that the, um, the ready rock wall the top of the wall is flush with the entrance drive where the landscape wall is, um, I think we're at 18 inches or two feet. I forget how, so that's, that would make that wall two feet higher than the 121 because 121 is pretty much not visible when you're coming down the entrance drive because it's flush with the sidewalk. So if we added the, if we continued the landscape wall, we would be adding more height to that wall on that side. So an alternative to bringing the ready rock up two feet to be a curve, or a curb rather, would be to put um, guardrail though there and have the height of the wall lower. Well, we, we still need to retain earth uh, because we've got to support the sidewalk. Right, but the wall, if it can be below the sidewalk on one side, it, it could be below, it could stop lower than that, what it is now if we went back to that visual and have a guardrail there in place of that, right? Because you're having a pretty steep drop. I'm surprised you don't need a safety guardrail there to prevent a fall. Um, we do. We've got the guardrail. I mean, if we zoom in on this, we've got the guardrail shown with the squares on and the then other the side fence shown oh. with the uh, circle line type. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm referencing the other side. Parapet wall side. Oh, the other side? Yeah. Okay. That's that's a parapet wall that sticks up that, <clears throat> um, that serves as a guardrail. Again, you know, objective being that we're doing everything we can to minimize the wetlands impacts, yeah, but my, Keep, keeping the profile as narrow as possible. If we introduce the guardrail, then you know we need a further setback to to have the wall be flush and provide a guardrail in there. The wall would have to get wider. The whole corridor would get wider by a couple of feet. Can you go back to the um, section, please?
So the guardrail here, the guardrail needs a certain setback from the, from the back face of the wall. And the guardrail also needs, the face of the guardrail needs a setback from the curb line. So that if we, if we took this detail on the left and put it on the right, <clears throat> um, the, the wall would move out and we would increase wetlands impacts and all kinds of things. But it looks like you have two feet there between the wall and the road, which is two, you have 21 inches on the left where you have the guardrail. So you could fit the guardrail in there. Yeah, but the guardrail needs to be set back from the curb further than that. We, we can't, I, I mean, I did this, I did this like a year and a half ago. Um, so I've forgotten what the actual metrics are, but this was the narrowest section we, we could do. That's why we did it this way, because this is the narrowest and therefore minimizes the wetlands impacts, which we're obligated to do <clears throat> as a limited project to, to do the crossing. And you're comfortable that the detail on the right meets code for yep. fall safety. So someone yep. walking on the road yep. next to that. I thought you need 42 inches high. It's, there's no sidewalk there. There's no pedestrians. This is just a vehicle along the side of the road. The sidewalk's on the other side. All right, those are my questions on this. Thank you. Paul, can I stay on? Can I stay on that topic for a minute? Um, I, I recognize there's no sidewalk on that wall section that Cheryl's talking about, but um, I, I I I see a safety risk here. Um, probably not an adult necessarily, but you know, young kids. What 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 exposure is the top two block? Um, I mean. How far is it above the grade? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, maybe a couple feet. That's I, all. I haven't called it out here, but it's it's what would be a nominal guardrail height. Is the Ready Rock, um, can it be engineered to anchor uh, a railing in? Um, I, I don't know. Um, you know, we went and, you know, we worked with the Ready Rock engineer yeah. a couple of years ago when we worked up this detail. And um, at that point in time, um, we were steered away from doing that. Is it possible? I don't know. I'd have to revisit it. Okay. I, I... But it's my understanding that we do, because the sidewalk isn't there, that's not a pedestrian area, that, you know, this is like, you know, the guardrail on the side of a road. You know, where there's no sidewalk, we don't need site fencing there. That's my understanding of the code. Yeah. Well, I, I guess in light of, uh, I don't want to keep everybody on this topic for too long, but I just raise it as a concern. If that's only okay. a two foot exposure of wall, granted the sidewalks on the other side, you're, you're you know expecting people to walk on the sidewalk, but somebody walking on that side of the road, if we only have two feet of exposure of block, we could have a safety issue there where you could have or the, the um, I mean yeah. you know if you if you look if you look on the left side the way the site fence tucks in there yeah it could be provided I think we could fit the site face fence in um, the space provided but it's our understanding that we, we're not required to do it under code understood I'm not questioning code I'm just I'm just looking at it as a okay. as a risk yeah. and, and what would yeah. be a good practice but I'll stop there. We can move on. Okay. Yeah, well, just as a follow-up, um, since you are in a residential neighborhood, I would think that um, kids might be out riding their bikes at night. So I have a business in a residential neighborhood, and after hours I have a lot of my neighborhood uh, kids come in and ride their bikes, and, you know, families walk in. So I would think um, they might be riding their bikes um, and using, you know, your parking lot um, just as something to do because Highland Street does not have any sidewalks on it, so they might actually be using um, this site, even though I know it's private property. But you are part of a neighborhood, so I would think you would expect some neighborhood um, um, activity going on. Um, so that would be my concern. And also, what does the guardrail look like does is it a traditional guardrail that you see you know along the street or is it you know a more attractive fence 
No, it, it's a it's a timber guardrail. Okay. Um, I've got a detail of it here someplace. I'm not sure what sheet it's on. It's shown uh -huh. on the renderings that we had. Um, yeah, but it's a it's a timber guardrail. It's not the metal highway ones that you see. It's you know the timber one. So oh, we have we have examples yeah. um, throughout Milton, Paul of of stone veneer um, drives entrances into uh, residential neighborhoods, and it and they they're directly over wetlands, right on wetlands. Um, we have multiple examples we can provide. This is a residential neighborhood, and for these neighbors, um, it would be much much. I would have a strong preference to be able to do a stone veneer all the way up the driveway. And then when you really begin to need the retaining walls, transition where it's not visible from the street because as, as, you know, as improved this ready rock is, it's, it's definitely gotten better, but it still has very much a commercial look and, and does not fit into this neighborhood whatsoever. So I would really like to see you go back and see if there's a way to do poured concrete. I've talked spoken with a contractor who does this all the time, just did a project in Milton right on the wetlands. Um, you, you do have to be careful, but um, it absolutely can be done. And I think it would make such a difference on this project to connect because right now it's a very inconsistent look to have a beautiful granite entry and then all of a sudden go to Ready Rock. It just, it, yeah, Meredith, it's not cohesive. I would, it's, we're just not gonna be able to do that. Well, I know that's a concern. I, I, we're just we not like going to be able to do it. it. It's, We've looked at it's it. It's a concern because it's mitigating. We've looked at it because yep. you've asked us to look at it, and we, and we don't think that we can do it. And what we've come up with is an alternative that we think is appropriate. Well, I mean, I drove out to Dover to look at your red rock, and it's really, really industrial. I personally don't like it. Granted, it was white. I mean, this looks a little bit nicer. Um, is there a way that you could make the first three or four courses ready rock and then on top of that do something safe? Because I really... So who, whoever whoever's talking, we can't hear them on the Zoom. So I don't know if the mic needs to be cranked up or what. All right. So my thinking would be, I guess I'm skeptical on, on two levels. One, I don't think the ready rock is fitting for Highland Ave, a scenic road. And I also don't think that the vegetation is actually going to grow and cover it. So. If we can create more of a dry bed in front of the wall and put up a lot more vegetation, I, I would really like to see something done with the ready rock. Whether it's the, lo the lower courses stay ready rock and, and then above it becomes faced um, or something. I mean, just to say we can't do it. Yeah, it's, I, I don't believe it can. I, I yeah. think it definitely can be done. I mean, we built the big Go, dig. We, yeah. can do a, we can do a wall here. Ford Ranch Road, the example, Todd Hamilton's project, tight on wetlands right there. He brought stone veneered beautiful sort of an entryway um, into a really nice residential neighborhood this um, this just does not fit in I don't think to Highland Street whatsoever <clears throat> and my concern is even moving forward if, if we're setting a bad precedent because um, if we are allowing it here would we then be allowing it in the future somewhere else Stonebridge Lane did it, Walcott Woods did it. But we've been consistent in asking for this. I think it's inconsistent in this situation to, to, to have a nice stone entryway and that what we're trying to create is, um, is not drawing your eye up and saying, you know what, what this is a commercial site in a residential neighborhood. <clears throat> so I feel pretty strongly about that. Um, other items of the landscape. So I guess going back to the wall and the trees, um, Sasha, are you still there? Yes. So um, one of your renderings, if you look, I guess, facing north, the south side of, of the main entrance, um, and then as the wall curves around, if you look on the plan, there's... 25 foot non-disturbed zone and there's a very small dry area and I guess I'm just skeptical skeptical that large trees tall trees are going to grow in such a small area 
without hitting the wetlands and then the root ball gets um, compromised and the tree won't thrive? Is that way off to assume that or? Um, anything being planted, um, I'm not sure exactly where you're talking about, but anything proposed in the right where your cursor is, just go down, pull the cursor, go right in there. All that area. I mean, how much of that is actually dry bed, and how much of that is wet? And do you think those? What I'm looking for here is tall trees that will block the wall, and then a little bit of the building as well. And yeah, I, I was I'm, just going to say everything proposed within this edge is they are things that tolerate wet. Um, soils, so wet loving plants, and there's numerous of them. And um, that's what's proposed through here. So right. hemlocks, uh, the sweet gum, all of those types of plants are things that thrive in this area and are probably things that are already growing in the in the wetland itself. So they will do well in this area, for sure. How tall is a hemlock at typically? Oh, really big, 40, 50 feet. Okay. But as th that becomes a maintenance, long-term maintenance because of the woolly adelgid issues. So they'd have to be spraying. You know, that's why we went with diversity. You know, we're not using one species. We've modeled this off of uh, ecosystem. So where you might have some things that are going to struggle um, we're, we've chosen a variety of plant material, variety of heights, so that you really do get the coverage. Uh, and it's not just one monoculture uh, at one height so that when they all grow up, which is kind of what's in some of the back areas there, you know, everything's grown up, grown up and you don't have any screening uh, through your, uh, at your eye level. All of this new planting coming in where we're using understory trees that will grow only to a certain height, um, along with some large canopy trees and large shrub material. All of the combination of layers will make this property better and more uh, interesting to look into for one, and um, you know, better screening for whatever is visible on the other side of the wetland woods. And just to follow up to Jim, it <clears throat> it does seem, and I understand the Bacardi, you know, the agreement with the Bacardis to really protect and buffer that. So I appreciate that. But it does seem really sparse um, along that retaining wall on that interior. Um, and even a little bit, um, I don't know if there's anything more you can do on Highland Street um, to protect those neighbors and give them a little more privacy as well. Can yeah, you add I more mean, trees? I think because we had such a large buffer that was not being disturbed. We felt that the, you know, bumping up along the Bacardi line where it was, we were close to the property line um, was, was a good idea, but where we have all the existing plant material within the wetland that will be remaining and will not be touched, um, that was kind of our using some of that existing um, we did add more plant material along this buffer area. Uh, and all of these in here are really to mitigate the, um, all the knotweed that's in that area. So would it be possible to expand the dry bed area into the wetlands and then regenerate the wetlands somewhere else on the site? Oh, you really want to keep your wetlands um, established? We can't touch the wetlands without an order of conditions from the Conservation Commission. But you have done it somewhere else on the site, right? I mean, there's no we, are, we are mitigating the wetlands that are being impacted right. by adding more area that is wet. Right. Um, but they are just on the um, north side, plan side of the of of the driveways. We can't we can't touch anything that's wet on the south side of that um, driveway. You can't because your order of conditions is already you, you, established? You, you, can't, just, you, just you can't. can't touch wetland. 
unless there's a spe unless you have permission to do it and you have to have a reason that's legitimate to do it you can plant i don't know whether you can plant it you can certainly plant within the 25 foot no disturb right uh, which we're doing but we don't have any plans to go into the wetlands and touch the wetlands other than um, some minor impacts to wetlands associated with the stream crossings yeah no, I understand. They already... allow you to impact them for access, but and that's where we had to replicate them um, for the access drive. You're allowed to impact them for that, but for not for any other reason. But so you're saying you could add more yeah, trees clearly, along clearly. along Highland Street, though, and you could add more trees along that retaining wall, if you would like. But there, there's a lot of, you know, I. I was out on site and was walking through there. There's a lot of trees there. It's going to be really field locating things uh, so that you're not disturbing the root zone of existing trees out there uh, where we're removing a lot of the um, the knotweed and the other invasives. You know, that's going to be an area that's going to be disturbed and is going to need to be planted and uh, filled in pretty quickly. But there are a lot of trees out there. So to show, you know, a, a whole bunch of vegetation on, along here that might, there might not be any room for it because there are a lot of existing trees within this edge. This is not a barren site by any means. We could street view it and look at the vegetation there. There are a lot of established trees. We might be able to, you know, move some things that, you know, this, I'm showing these plants here, but, you know, where they end up is going to be based off not trying, of trying to maintain the existing trees and working around what's there. We're going to be field locating a lot of these plants where we're not wanting to uh, remove any additional trees. That was my reservation for showing a lot of plants in here because it's well established. Um, and, you know, why we should just use the, those areas that are, are already have a great uh, mature stand of trees there. We should allow those to remain there and not disturb them. Add understory for sure, but where you have a good canopy, better to use that existing canopy. All right. Could you point out that you, there's nine trees that are 20 feet tall? Could you highlight where those are located? Um, I don't know. I'd have to pull up my um, planting plan. I don't know exactly where they are. I know one of them is the tulip tree. There's a few down uh, along this Bacardi. edge. Um, I'm not sure exactly where they all are. Are there any on Highland Street, along Highland Street? These are understory and shrub plant material. Um, Which won't really- I know there are some in this area. There are a couple in here. I'm happy with that area. Yeah. But there's a whole ton of, I mean, the majority of trees are within the four inch or greater than seven foot height. So um, that's in the category of the concom that's you know, the, the higher, uh, higher, highest size plant material. And how tall is the wall in the area that we're talking about right now? Right where your cursor is? Paul, do you have the wall heights? Sorry, yeah, I do. So the, this is like by the service area there? Yeah. yeah, service area up to the radius. Mm -hmm. Yeah, up to the well, it varies because the you know I can just share again if you want. <clears throat> it varies because the but it's, it's sloping down. Oh, hold on. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay, this is sloping down here, so you know that it's it's. You know, one sixteen to one thirty five at the top, and then you get down to the bottom here, and it's it isn't called out, but it's like, you know, in this area we're one twenty one, one twenty two, and one eighteen, so it's only three or four feet down, you know, in this area in here. 
put out the radius, it's 19. The radius of the wall? Oh, yeah, up in here. 116 um, minus 135 is 19, right? Yep. So that's a 19-foot wall right there? Yep. The ready rock that we're going to stare at from Highland Ave? Well, I don't think you'll see it from Ave because you've got all this wood and wetlands area here, so I, I don't know how you're going to see that from, from this is all forest, basically. Okay. What I mean, about the know, winter? We're not, we're not showing the trees yeah. here, but this is all wooded. I, I don't think you're going to see it. What about the winter condition? Winter. Yeah. Um, yeah I, 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 I'm not sure, but I mean, you know, I, is, is the house, the existing house, it, it, you know, 121 Highland, 111 Highland, is that one, can you see that from the street? Yes. And Just barely, but that's not a 20 foot rock face. Thing. This is an issue for me. So we got to find a way to get more trees to cover that ready walk or change that ready walk to something a little more palatable, I think. And, and the problem, even though the, the, plant, the plant material chosen can tolerate wet feet, they don't thrive. Plants don't thrive having wet feet. So they'll grow um, more weakly. They'll grow spindly. They won't be full. They won't grow as quickly as if they were in a drier condition. So I feel like that's going to be a long-term maintenance issue. Um, you know, um, it, it's just been wet. This whole season's been a very wet season. Um, so I just think even it, they're just the plants are going to struggle. They'll just permanently struggle in that location, no matter what it is. I mean, maybe the roadies. Um, the roadies might do the best, would be my guess. Um, but they grow spindly. Um, you know, none of the evergreens are going to do well. <clears throat> Shad boy would be fine. Yeah. So I think that retaining wall needs <clears throat> some attention and protection. Like you never see a densely planted wetland. No. no matter how many trees are in it, wetlands are straggly looking, no matter how many trees are there. Okay. All right. Any other comments before we... No, I'm good. All right. We'll, we so will we'll look at the, the take one more crack at it. We've got till next Wednesday. Making... Well... Be looking for your plans as soon as we'll you can what, send them over. We'll That'll be great. We'll see whether and, it's and possible. Attention and to if, that, we, yeah. if it's possible, we'll do it. And, and that's all wall. your power, Ned. Yeah. Come on, we're with you. And I, again, Stonebridge Lane, I, Mark Lane, look, look at all the projects that have, have uh, used a veneer. We're not asking for a solid stone wall. We're, you know, we could, we're asking for a veneer. A concrete covered veneer is all we're asking for. But we're also in the entryway. But the pro the problem, well, the question is how far in, is is makes sense. To the it, roadway, what's whatever is visible from Highland Street. That, and the other thing, just before we move on, that's presumably all the way into yeah. the circle. And basically, that's where that's, I'm seeing it. And that would be a great not, transition but, to the but, Ready Rock. What I'm saying is that that's unlikely to be possible. All right. Um, the other thing is in the permit, which we'll get to. Um, you have a cobblestone apron, but that is, did I miss it? It's not, it doesn't seem to be referenced. It's, it's, uh, it's on the um, rendering. But it's not in the, could we add it? Because you have the stone pillars in the permit. Oh, it, it, yes, yeah. absolutely. All right, that's what, yeah, of, just so it's consistent. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I go back just yep. to answer this question, just yeah. in the interest of trying to resolve as many things quickly? Tonight, yes, what, yeah. what, is, what is the reason, Ned, that the cast-in-place wall can't be built. Is that an engineering reason, or, or is it a cost issue? I think it's probably a combination of both. But I would, I would defer to the engineer to answer that well, question. I think it is both. I mean, if the cost implications are significant, but um, again, we chose the Ready Rock system because 
it can be constructed from the inside and therefore we don't need to do work beyond the outside of it which minimizes the wetland impact so this whole thing was driven by you know minimizing the impact of the project you know on the environment that's okay. so that that's why we have this system if we start to do precast concrete wall we will be doing additional disturbances just to build the thing you know beyond the face of the wall <clears throat> now, I, I can't speak to the financial implications but i suspect they're significant well I, as i the line of questioning i had about the height of that south side of the wall is to reduce the amount of visual impact of that ready walk so i mean it would be great if you could give something on one of these suggestions to you whether it's stone facing concrete or uh, a different detail on how high that ready rock is coming up we're trying to reduce the, imp the visual impact of a very industrial material and uh, you know wetlands interference or impacts are, are obviously important so we're trying to quiz you as, and have you think about anything else that you can do to address the concern that we have. I think we've had this concern. Um, I've talked about these retaining walls. That's why I asked for the section with the landscape materials. I was concerned that they wouldn't cover it completely or it would take a long time for it. And the visualization kind of confirmed that in my mind. So, um, I mean, even if there's another finish on the ready rock, um, the visual, the image that's in the plan set is not the most attractive finish. And if that's the most attractive that they have, um, even the coloration of it, that sort of brown color, I mean, these are all important considerations in terms yeah. of the visual impact. And I did go on, and I can, you know, there are some that are better than others, certainly, but I, again, would save those for the areas that are really those high retaining walls in the back side, I think the driveway just that needs to be a, a stone veneer, and I see it all throughout Milton. So I'm, I'm sure it can be done. Paul, Paul one one more question on this: Do, Are you familiar with anybody that makes a gravity block that has a natural finish on it? Um, <clears throat> I haven't shot the product on this. Um, you know, this was sort of. We came up with it in coordination with um, Erlen, the, the contractor on it. Um, you know, we typically have gone with, you know, products like Versalock and things like that. <clears throat> that isn't as good an application here. Um, you know, I think those finishes uh, vary. I mean, we can look and see what alternative products there may be, you know, of this type of system that might have, you know, better options in terms of the, the finish yeah yeah th this special permit calls for high quality construction materials which not only include the building but it includes the stonework the walls every aspect of this project in this special permit should be high quality materials and it's going to be the I'm first not, thing we see for a very long time yeah. we will be living with that okay anything um, well, I, I guess one more thing, yeah. and Sashi, this might be helpful, um, you know, to recognizing that your landscape plan shows new plants, and, and it's hard to depict the ones? existing plants. And I, I understand what you were saying earlier, that as you prepare that planting plan, you're recognizing what's existing and fitting as much as you can in around it. Um, are, do you have uh, photos that you could show us again? I feel like we've seen them already um, that might help us recognize the density of existing plantings that are to remain. Um, I don't have, uh, I mean, I could pull up my photos, but if, you know, if we just street, this is street view of the site, you know, we can see what's what's out there and these are all pretty good sized trees um you know except, except where the old house was in the barn but going down here uh there's certainly more trees on this side of the road than there are on the opposite side of the road 
Right. And a lot of these are young, you know, some uh, saplings coming up. Some it's very mixed traditional uh, woodland here. This is that whole area where, you know, we have knotweed, which I'm sure is not a very pretty site. Um, you know, this gets removed. New plants, shrubs, and understory trees go in, but all of this is remaining. We're not thinning like they've done down at the Bacardi's. We're not thinning the woodland. We're keeping it all as is. And this is pretty, you know, pretty established. Well, just as a note, so you can see, Sean, like a lot of those trees are already dead. And what hap that's what happens in wetland situation trees don't thrive they're not full you know in, in its woods and you're going to have a natural um, dying off of material but if we and those are great for wildlife all of those dead uh, trees are really great for birds and all kinds of wildlife but so in, in the, these areas they're regenerating but this is a fully leafed out visual um, so um, if we drive by now, or you know, a month ago, October. nothing <clears throat> was there. There aren't any evergreens in this um, in this view. It's all the situation. On the uh, survey that we had, there are evergreens. Uh, we do know that there are evergreens okay. further in, uh, not right on the roadway, uh, in this up upland area. But on the survey, we they did note of note what was deciduous and what was evergreen and there there are evergreens on site you know we can certainly add more along the upland buffer area we can add more uh, evergreens along the wall if that is uh, desired um, these are not this is not wetlands that we're planting in so they will they they will be dry um, should have no problem yeah. surviving this area that would be great to add some at that area. Okay. I think we should move on from mm -hmm. this so we can. Um, now, I, what I'd like to do is open it up to the board on just on other questions that we have for um, the team here. Um, so, and we can start one with. of the things that. Um, you know, we should all be aware of is that things that we've talked about most recently are not reflected necessarily in the plans, but are reflected in a draft decision as conditions. So the Such question I would have, Ned, is how many of those things can get incorporated into the plan? Uh, for example, the uh, cobble, you know, at the end of the driveway. I had made a request for concrete sidewalks rather than asphalt. I know they're still shown as asphalt. I don't know if the board agrees with me on that. But it, I'm just thinking about when the building commissioner goes to get a full set of plans, if the plans are inconsistent with conditions that are in a decision, it's confusing. I know that we, will, we would put that the decision um, has um, priority, priority plans. Right. but it's still easier to get as much into the plans as possible. So that, I just wanted to, <coughs> yeah, in, I think, in looking through those, yeah. I wanted to check that out. I think that if we go through the proposed um, decision with the with the conditions that are in and any additional conditions that want to be um, that imposed in or we can agree on, um, we can certainly add details to the plans uh, and submit those, um, you know, in the near future. I would think that those would be minor details. It would be not minor details, but details that can be added and addressed. Okay. So just for the purpose of efficiency of time, maybe rather than just opening it up for general questions, each of us, why don't we go through the special, the actual draft of the special permit, and our, I think our questions will surface as we go through Mer sort of in a... Meredith, can we also go through the... Um, um, the memo? The memo, which yep. compares the zoning and whether... Yep. Uh, <clears throat> the compliance com component of the zoning, because ultimately Correct. that's do you want it, Should we do that first? Ultimately, we need to make sure that we, we feel it's compliant with the zoning before we get to a decision, Correct. right? But yeah. I thought more specific um, items might come up doing the permit first and then the memo, or we could do either one. This is what I'm referring to, the um, 
Ned's memo, which is the um, 111 Highland bylaw compliance, where he basically went through <coughs> piece by piece, which was very helpful, Ned, um, on the special permit and then how they um, how so, they believed that they complied. Can, can I go to two specific points before mm -hmm. we get into sure. that? Because yeah. I, I'm concerned once we get into that, that'll be hours long mm -hmm. to get through okay. that. Um, the, the service drive, Ned, what is the vehicle traffic that will come down the service drive, either on a per day basis or a per week basis? I think um, the total trips that were um, identified based on the council were done in Newburyport are 288 trips per day. That would be 144 vehicles per day. That would be including one or two delivery trucks, shift changes, um, and uh, occasional visitors to the site. So the, the traffic I'm thinking of mostly is a delivery vehicle that's backing down that service drive. Mm -hmm. How many a day do you think that is? One or two. And, and is there a time of day that that is planned for or can that be planned for? Absolutely. Between, we're proposing in the draft of the special permit, I think between 10 and 2. Mm -hmm. Certainly after, after the, any, the morning commute and before the afternoon high school, you know, mid-afternoon commute. Um, but that's certainly easy to condition. And two vehicles a day? One or two deliveries per day. Uh -huh. Is that seven days a week or is five that days? Pardon me? Five days a week. So it's only Monday to Friday. Correct. So on the weekends, there'll be no backup alarms Correct. that the neighbors would hear. Right. Okay. And, and that's something that you're comfortable making part of the conditions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's, there's separately, there's one or two um, trash recycling pickup, but that would occur out in the rear parking lot. Um, and not down in the, uh, um, in the, in the loading area. Okay. Um, I guess separately on traffic, and I don't believe it's going to show up in what you have here, but um, we've had plenty of conversation about traffic, and we've had conversation about traffic that's not um, memory care traffic. Right. And uh, the neighbors have talked for weeks, if not months, and, and maybe it's maybe it is more like years um, for the you know about the burden that they've had on Spafford and um, there's I think an opportunity to reduce some of the burden off of Spafford and I feel like we could reduce some of the burden off of Highland as well um, and what I'm talking about is the hospital business traffic mm -hmm. and uh, I, I you know, I have an interest in having the hospital, and I, I think the board members would agree, um, but I have an interest in seeing the hospital business traffic enter and leave the hospital campus only via Reedsdale. And, you know, once that's achieved, we won't see any more photos of linen trucks or air, ga air gas trucks going up Spafford. Um, I do also believe there's plenty of issues of traffic on Spafford that has nothing to do with the hospital. Um, I happened to be walking up Spafford um, a recent evening, and there was a police cruiser coming down Spafford. So um, there's plenty of traffic that's on Spafford that isn't the hospital. But my opinion is that if we can have the hospital business traffic and all of the business traffic enter and leave the hospital by Reedsdale, not only does it take that traffic off Spafford, it takes it off all of the ladder roads, and it takes it off a of Highland. So I see it as definitely beneficial to the neighbors' concerns with Spafford, but it's also beneficial to take that traffic off of, off of Scenic Road and away from that intersection that is, you know, Highland and Canton okay. Ave, because that doesn't need any more traffic. So I had a conversation with uh, Rich Fernandez today, and um, I believe you've talked to Rich today too, and I don't know how the mechanics of this work, but Rich said he would make a commitment that the hospital would um, change the terms of the, he would address this within the agreements with the vendors that service the hospital. So I'm not sure how, but I think we can work through this so that this becomes you know, part of the arrangement that the hospital makes that commitment. Um, 
I know the hospital's not sitting here, and the hospital's not the applicant, but um, I'm sure uh, I'm sure we can find a way to do that. I just thinking preliminarily um, about that. I think we can certainly agree to a condition that would require us to coordinate with the hospital on its efforts to curb its traffic. My only concern is if there's breakage and it's a hospital vehicle, who, it, how does it, what enforcement action is available under the permit? Because we can't be held re ultimately responsible for enforcement action that might occur because a hospital delivery um, doesn't follow the, the protocol. Mm -hmm. um, we're certainly putting ourselves in the bullseye for any failure of our employees and our deliveries to not follow the, the, the required routes. Um, and that includes fines uh, for each occurrence and that we, we would be, the, you know, the, the Northbridge would be responsible for those fines. So uh, I'll, I'll try to think through how we can manage that, but yeah. I'm certainly, look at it, I can't, it is beyond frustrating to me representing this applicant to continue to see the videos and the photographs of hospital traffic using Spafford Road when in my mind it's a fairly simple management issue mm -hmm. um, to address. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly burdened our ability to move forward with this project with this board. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not here to beat up the hospital. I think the hospital has taken a pretty good beating. Um, and I'm not sure that all of it's deserved. Um, you know, I appreciate Rich's commitment today to try to do something that he feels like he can do for the neighbors. Um, and uh, I, I'm confident that, and it may be an overtime thing, right? I mean, it means retraining drivers, retraining vendors, and making sure, and, and yes, it might take a little while to get them all there, but. Um, Signage. Signage, um, signage, know, certainly. Yeah, um, I, I think this surveillance. There, yeah, this, yeah, there are ways to do it. Rich all acknowledged that yes, compliance is is a challenge, and you know I I, I have a leadership role in a company too. I understand what it's like, and you can get there. It just yeah. it takes a little work. It might be a little bit hard, but um, I'll leave it to you to have a conversation with Rich, and and I honestly appreciate his commitment yeah. to uh, to make that condition better. That's one that he feels is within his ability to, to, to control and improve, and he's committed to doing it, and, okay. and, 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 and I was I, grateful that he did. That's great, and I, what I can say is that um, I've spoken to uh, Jim and Wendy about this as well, because they did speak with Rich late this afternoon, and they are on board with committing to some form of a condition that would require them to work with the hospital to help mitigate the traffic I issues that are happening. Mm -hmm. Their concern, obviously, as I've addressed, is, you know, is an enforcement ability to enforce, and how do you enforce against um, this entity when this entity isn't responsible? But we'll work on that, and we'll, I, I'm happy to try to draft a condition for review um, next week. Mm -hmm. Thank and, we'll, you. and we will continue to work with the hospital and try to find ways to make it better. Thank you. All right. So that's a great phone call. I didn't realize that happened. Nice that's job. Good. That makes great. me feel a lot better. You know, honestly, he's he's um, rich. Rich is challenged, right? He's trying to do what he can, and um, and and this is an area where he feels like he can do something to help the neighbors. So he's willing to do it, and we'll figure it out. Well done. Great. All right. So why don't we go? I think we should go through this the permit because it's more specific on. Um, there's some more detail in here that to go through this first and then go through the memo. Sure. Yeah. Does that sound good as questions arise? I, I or did just, you feel a reason I, to I go just, through the... Um, just would point out that there are some of the site design standards and building design standards for, that are more subjective. And I think that's where when we look at um, a decision in terms mm -hmm. of what conditions we, we place on it, it's in the context of those 
subjective okay. parameters. So we don't have to go through necessarily all of the things that are, does it meet the front setback and the rear setback and so forth. But um, I, I, I would think that if... You would if, prefer if, to go through the memo if, first. If, at least the, the standards, the design standards. Mm -hmm. If um, all right, if everyone's Tim, could you pull that up? That. The um, the for, uh, April fifth compliance bylaw from Ned, and I can get to the page which is the standards. Mm -hmm. Meredith, you want me to put that up? All right. Yes, please. Because page one A and B C. Yeah, well, actually, it's more than just the standard. So if we look mm -hmm. at, I would say starting with um, open space. Mm -hmm. So where the language um, says that open space, uh, you know, shall be left in its natural state or landscaped, um, and then there's percentages. Um, and there should be, you know, trees of certain height. Mm -hmm. I guess that's where, when we get to the planting section and of the right. um, decision, we can um, we can refer back to this and think and decide whether. Um, so that's you know, the top of page provided. four. Uh, top of yes. page four. Sorry, is where we're starting. Top Tim, do you want to scroll to the top? Right. Of, the April. of page four. Fifth. It was from maybe from ten. And this so idea about the view. Okay. <clears throat> so should so I when just we're thinking about the the planting plan and the landscaping, we can look at this and mm -hmm. where the zoning itself, the language that is, um, I guess the standard language. Um, text, not the italicized, is taken from the zoning language itself. Mm -hmm. So where it says that... Um, Which the, shall enhance the prospect of the building viewed from outside. Exactly. And That's provide perfect. alternative views from within the building. Attractive views. Attractive views within yeah. the, from so within that, the building. So That's, that's where um, yeah. you know we have judgment to make about the... Yeah. Um, and the driveways and the sidewalks when we think about the materials. Two, I think we can refer to that. So that's, um, and then I think um, when we look at what's been proposed for parking, the parking requirements here, you know, um, have, we've delved into this quite a bit and they reduce the number, but again, this is what we refer, can refer back to. Mm -hmm. And then keep scrolling, Tim, um, on the sign, which is mm -hmm. on the top of page five. Uh, <clears throat> again, the design materials, appearance of the sign, um, you know, the final design signage design would be outside of this process, but um, certainly um, our input into how it's integrated into the entrance, I think is important. Mm -hmm. So that's this where it's referred to here. I'm just tying back the things that we've right. been discussing to the actual zoning language itself. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I keep scrolling down to design standards now at the bottom of page five. Item 10. Item 10, right. So um, this is something we've talked about quite a bit, the existing terrain, the earth moving and retaining walls. Again, um, this is where it's a balance between uh, impact to the wetlands and, and cut and fill and retaining wall. So then it becomes a question of if we hit the right balance and what are those retaining walls, at least in, in, in my view. And then um, the existing significant trees and groves of trees and natural features to be preserved and integrated into the landscape. Again, this is why we've been talking about this quite a bit. Um, and the conditions we can continue to think about with respect to that. 
um, the driveway, the layout mm -hmm. to avoid extreme cut could and I, fill again. Could I just there? jump in just to correct sure. one thing in that compliance on trees? Mm -hmm. the, I re reviewed the order of conditions today. The requirement is three and a half inches, not four inches. That for every tree with three Correct. and a half inch caliper? Right. Okay. And you have a calculation on the, on the plan set that we have of how many trees are being removed, the caliper total, I and think how many are being provided, right? I think that's right, yep. Um, I do know that as, as part of the order of conditions, we have to provide uh, a, um, uh, an accounting of every tree that is okay. actually removed and we have to provide that to the conservation agent for review, and that will ultimately define the replication that's necessary or the payment that's necessary. Um. So my question is when they make the payment, does that go into a, the Conservation Commission's account or does that go into Town of Milton, like general fund, and then who then gets a say as to where those trees get planted in town? That's a good question. Um, Shade Tree it, Committee should have. I some. don't. I think. Well, let me um, <clears throat> see if the specific reference. Because if the trees are being removed from this neighborhood, I would think it, they should be replaced in this neighborhood. And even if it's along, um, you know, people's private property, because Spafford doesn't have, in particular, does not have a sidewalk, so they don't have a public uh, tree lawn area. So I would think that maybe trees would then be, you know, on private property. If people want to raise their hand and ask for trees, we're happy to plant. Because every tree we plant is a tree that we don't have to pay for. So, but, but specifically, I don't know where that fund is maintained. It's, it is presumably, um, it's not subject to the general, to the general fund. It is a specific account that's used to then acquire and plant trees in other parts of town where those go i have no idea i really don't but i don't have i i i tend to agree with your thought that we should plant as many in the neighborhood as possible and that would be obviously people would have to be willing to receive trees but we we'd certainly be open to that Okay, so um, driveways, again, talking about the um, existing terrain and landscape features yeah. and um, their, the, the width, the construction, the lighting of those access roads and driveways. Um, so again, our focus on that is really tied back to yeah. the design standards. Then scroll down to D, um, the creation of an attractive mm -hmm. initial view from existing streets and neighboring properties in harmony with the neighborhood. Yeah. Again, that's what we're talking about quite a bit. Um, e, um, the building being located and oriented to be compatible with the terrain and features of the land. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about that. And I, I think that that's um, not something that there's really condition can be related to, but um, the parking areas, the landscaping related to the and lighting related to the parking areas again topics of conversation quite a bit with us um, sustainable practices uh, you know one of the things i would say here is that the lighting controls um, are an important part of the site sustainable practices uh, energy use on those and we'll talk about those controls a little bit further i think in the conditions um, the use in, of environmentally friendly materials. I think, Sean, this can get to what you had suggested, perhaps using pervious pavement at the uh, rear parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, so that, again, ties to one of the design standards here. So, um, sorry on that. Um, so the town is looking to, you know, adopt the, the st enhanced stretch, stretch code. Mm -hmm. So would this be subjected to um, the new... Depends Enhanced on stretch timing. Code. You know, like that stretch code, if it were to pass, I think it would be probably the January um, effective isn't it date. Coming, isn't it coming? It's in the May town meeting, May but town I don't meeting. think you can make it yeah, um, the original. effective as of July. There's only two dates in the year that you can make it effective, and I'm pretty sure it's July and January. 
and if it's adopted in May, I don't think you are allowed to make it effective in July. So it depends when they are able to file for the building permit. But if it went, so it's at the time of when the building yeah. permit gets. Correct. Yeah. So it probably it takes what three months for the AG's office to approve the bylaw. So if it gets approved in May, then it doesn't come into effect for at least ninety days. I think it's probably January mm -hmm. effective yeah. date because you usually have an effective date, a, a bit of a gap. So because some people who are working on their documentation would have to basically kind of, uh, they, they need this kind of period to build up to it, to, uh, to prepare for it in the building department as well. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that's in the um, information that Sustainable Milton put together in terms of those um, dates. Yeah. But Because um, I would think if the town of Milton as a whole adopts it, um, then that's, you know, because I'm your Climate Action Committee representative. And um, so if the town of Milton adopts it, then I would think that this project would want to. It's all happening in this one same year that we're adopting it, and this project could be pulling permits. Yeah, I mean, this project's subject to the updated stretch code. Right, already, which is because it's, in July it's in 1st. July yeah. They, uh, July, yeah. I mean, I imagine that they won't be filing for their building permit <coughs> by then, but I, I, I suspect that um, the difference in between the two, there's going to be some differences. But the stretch code, as of July, uh, will put into place, uh, I think it puts into place controls for lighting. Um, but um, don't quote me on that. Well, even like going electric, the whole build. You know, I'm just thinking if the average homeowner, you know, if it gets adopted in town, if the average homeowner is subjected to the advanced stretch mm -hmm. code, and I'm not taking a position one way or the other, if it gets adopted, then I would think that we would want our municipal buildings and our new new commercial buildings to be they, subjected to, it. to be. It to, it's not just a residential. It's commercial right, as commercial. Well. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, this is yeah. this particular piece is referring to um, the site, but there's another p part on the building for sustainability mm -hmm. here as well. Um, the last sentence: the use of environmentally friendly materials will also support the enhancement of indoor air quality and reduce life cycle costs. So, right. So, so that's in the building envelope is re referenced. Yeah, so there's that's going to be in the building portion mm -hmm. as well. Um, on, the, on the landscaping, thank you, Sasha. You are a landscape architect, yeah. and you've been preparing the plan. So that is a, a, a zoning requirement. Um, again, the screening of the building and the parking areas when viewed from off-site. It's in a requirement in the zoning. Um, I'm going to keep going down. In a manner that will enhance and screen the view of the building and parking areas. Right. Yeah. Okay. Then, I think from here, I'd like to scroll down to the building design <coughs> standards on number 11. So the the piece that we pieces that we need to look at in this section is the building consistent and coherent in all its elements and compatible with its surroundings in form, scale, and massing, um, and treatment of all facades in a consistent yeah. manner. Um, the scale of the building not overpowering its site or context, having an inviting and human scale. Let the entrance be distinctive, principal entrance, that windows and doors have appropriate detail and be set back or protrude forward. We haven't talked about some of these details and the architectural, mm -hmm. um, but they are here. And then the, um, the exterior lighting on the building itself, which we spoke about a little bit, the roof lines. And then building materials being of high quality, um, traditional materials and colors. Uh, so we need to talk about that a bit. This is where the unrelieved flat surfaces on the facade and the windows. And then something that we haven't talked about, it does say here that compressors and other mechanical equipment for systems in the building shall be visually screened and audibly buffered so as not to exceed 
50 decibels. So I don't know, Ned, if you uh, have any information on the, the only piece of equipment I can think of at the moment is probably the, the generator. generator. Uh, but if you had some... The generator was not, will not be on the roof. That's in a well on the back side of the building that's pretty well buffered. Um, there are mechanicals proposed for the roof. Um, they're in a, in a roof well. Um, it's a, it's a, an obligation uh, as, a, as part of the certificate of compliance, um, really, that when operating, they, the, the, the noise levels are below, at or below here. Um, we'll have to, we'll have to, that'll be a, a subject of review by the building commissioner, um, both with the submittal of plans and obviously um, back at when, he, when they look for a build, for, a build, for an occupancy permit. Yeah, I just think that where we're granting the special permit, we would want to say that that's a condition that that be uh, reviewed and approved by the building commissioner. I think that's that's fair. Okay, um, and then on the sustainable build uh, sustainable building practices, um, you know, part of this is material use. Part of this is whether you have an all electric building. You've already said you're not planning to put in solar panels. It doesn't make sense, but you know, it might make sense in the future, so we could make a condition that it be solar ready, which is part of the new stretch code, up the specialized stretch code, that would take into consideration roof loads, so the, the design of the structure of the roof, as well as the electrical infrastructure. So that could be a, um, a condition that we consider. So how um, would it be ready for solar in the future? I mean, how would it be? You have, while well, your um, roof is designed to oh, take sorry, the load I'm sorry, of it. I'm sorry, I'm the question. How would it be uh, attractive for solar in the future if it isn't now? Like, well, what you would could change? have tree loss. You could have uh, someone changes the, <clears throat> I mean, they have one company analyze it. There could be another company that comes and analyzes it and has a different take on it um, somewhere down the road. I mean, the technology continues to change. Thank you. Um, just because I know, <coughs> Meredith, you want to get to the decision right. itself, I'm going to try and quickly get. That's that's it. On the the rest of this is is um, what they submitted to us in terms of what the requirements were, which I believe they submitted everything we've asked for. Cool. So that's it. Yeah, that's enough. I just was going to reemphasize high quality materials. Um, be used. Okay. Yeah, then we can go through more the, the architectural. Anything else that people wanted to add that <clears throat> stood out? Yeah, I guess H was the um, on page 11 is something to highlight that I've. Um, Okay. Great. All right. Okay. So let's start. Then let's go through because I think we'll be able to address um, many of these items. Tim, can you pull up the special permit and site plan approval draft that Ned has provided? Uh, just give me half a second. Sure. Thank you. Okay, great, Ned. Sorry, the screen is behind me, so it's, um, all right. So in walking us through this, um, most of this is boilerplate, page one here. I don't know if anyone had any questions. Um, 
on the page one and part of page two where it's a list of what's incorporated. Yep. Um, it's listing plans, but it's not listing other reports like the construction, the construction management plan, um, the tree preservation plan. Those are identified as separate um, exhibits. Okay. So I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. On page three. On page um, three. You know, construction. There's a construction management phasing requirement. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. that's exhibit C. Tree preservation protection. That's exhibit D. Those we would simply attach the the plans that were submitted, yeah. unless they need to be amended. Okay. So, just I'm just looking at the language. So it says that. Uh, under the drawings, it says that they're incorporate that the permits incorporated the plan set. Down below, does it say that those are actually incorporated? Those other documents being incorporated into the site plan approval, because everything gets lumped together under site plan. Mm -hmm. Every single document. So I just want to make sure that it, it's actually mm -hmm. in the definition of site plan that all of these documents are included. Thank you, Jess. The permits incorporate a plan set entitled and containing the following sheets. It's the sheets, but it doesn't but say not. containing the construction management no. plan. So we have so to look at the language down further. Following sheets and construction management plan. Or, or that you're just using that as the example? I was using it as an example because then and it says what Ned's referring actual. to on page three. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to understand how that actually becomes incorporated if you, into the plan. If you look at the, plan. the first oh, yeah. sentence yeah. in the first paragraph on page two. The so documents, the listed, documents above listed above comprise the site, comprise plan. The site plan which is incorporated into the permits by reference and made a part of the permits as Exhibit A. And then I relist them on Exhibit A. And it includes the Co Conservation Commission's Order of Conditions. And the Town Wetland Bylaw. Does that? Well, I'm just trying to understand. We can look at this a little further. I wasn't sure that what the way it's phrased down later, uh, saying that that's a requirement, is the, the same as incorporating them into the site plan right. documents. This is the way the Walcott Woods okay. permit was drafted, um, okay. and that's the most complete special permit that I think mm -hmm. has come out of the planning board. And so I used that as the as the starting point for the draft. I didn't change anything that didn't need to be changed, but I can enhance some of that to make it clearer that. Um, okay. But I but I did. So for example, in the Walcott Woods, the plans were all listed, and those were identified. And then separately, there was an exhibit you know, an Exhibit C for construction management and phasing, there's an Exhibit D, tree preservation. They are still incorporated clearly into the obligations of the, of the permit because the permit has to read overall as a consistent document. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Wait, can I, can yes. I, have, I have a different topic? Is yep. that okay? Are we done with this topic? I think so. Is that clarify? Yeah. Um, okay. So under enforceability and enforcement. Um, what page are you on? Oh, first page. Okay. Second it's, paragraph. Yep, second paragraph. It says the requirements are independent obligations of the applicant and run with the land as an obligation of all subsequent owners and leases. So a lot of this, um, um, the permit was all based on who the applicant is today. So um, it has testimonies been given to us as this is a um, company that is highly respected, that they, um, you know, are good neighbors, 
um, that they care about the um, community in which they um, do business in. So my question is, because this whole permit and bylaw was based on the applicant, what happens if the applicant is no the owner is no longer this owner? Um, so that's I'm struggling a little bit. Again, it goes back to what was presented at town meeting, and um, there are a lot of not good operators out there. So how do we know who they're going to sell to and when they're going to sell to? Um, and I know they're going to have to follow the special permit if a special permit is granted. Um, but it just, I think it needs to be pointed out that we don't know who our neighbor, and the neighbors don't know who their neighbor could be in five years or ten years. And I think that's kind of a, a challenge. You know, look at, again, we talked about Stewart Healthcare. You know, who knows who's going to come in and buy this? So... I think that is an important thing to pass, um, not to look over and pass over. That the potential is there for somebody who's not as um, reputable. That's it. Well, it says it shall be enforceable in court by the town. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. I think Maggie's getting to its applicant, the successors yeah. or assigns, right? right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Flag it for now. Yep. Yeah, that was just my. I'm pointing it out. Okay. Good. I did right. have something on page two, and I think okay. Meredith, you did too, which is the paragraph right after the numbered. Um, if modified, it's the second to last sentence. If modified in that process, the site plan as so modified in the process referring to DEP shall become the final site plan. A copy of which shall be provided to the board as a minor change. Um, I. My suggestion is that it would be provided to the board for determination to whether it's a minor change or a change requiring an, an amendment. Yes. And just also like strict compliance. I've run into that issue before. The definition of strict. Is it strict or is it um, substantial? substantial. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know. I don't have an opinion, but um, there is a difference there. Would you like me to be editing this as you go along, or are we... I think if you... Maybe you could just highlight, Tim. Yeah. I don't think we have to change that would... language to, uh, on, on the screen. But, yeah, if there's proposed language... The one language... thing that we ran into previously, I think it was with the 131 Elliott Street when it said strict compliance. If you have a product manufacturer change, because maybe that product's no longer available, uh, it had to come back. And then we modified that special permit to, to change it from strict to being substantially um, in substantial compliance. And then gave um, the Tim or the person in that position the authority to uh, decide whether it was substantially compliant or not. And Tim brought things to the board for, mm -hmm. for um, consideration as he felt appropriate. And so, I think we would want that opportunity yeah. to, decide, to determine if it is a minor change. But strict really or, means you're going to have to come back and do an amendment for something that could be pretty minor. Whereas substantially means you could treat it as a minor change versus a, an amendment is the way I understood it. Um, I am reminded by uh, Jim and Wendy that they are separately subject to very strict protocols that, under the control of the State Office of Elder Affairs and any transfer of, of interest in the property would be subject to a review and approval by that office it's not simply okay. handing off to somebody else that next operator would have to be uh, certified um, and have a track record uh, with the state in order to be able to, to take that role on okay. having said that you know 20 years from now mm -hmm. you know you're right it's very very possible that there at some point um, somebody else is operating but 
for the foreseeable future, it's a Vita of Milton. Yeah. I did notice um, maybe a little levity at the moment um, in the first full sentence under enforcement. Um, spell check didn't correct. There's an extra S there, isn't there? <laughs> I got it. Ch spell check doesn't correct mm -hmm. words that are spelled properly. That's it. Where it's a family you? public hearing, everybody. <laughs> All right, so we'll change that. Okay. I have a question. Yep. If we're only flagging, when will we get around to? adjusting language well I haven't prepared any language change I've just been I've just flagged so I'm not prepared but if you are prepared with language change I think we could show it mm -hmm. if anybody else is prepared for it mm -hmm. I think we'd appreciate that opportunity to do that otherwise I'd rather run through the whole document first, and then if we have time, and come back right. and work on language. Determining what unless network. somebody has language yeah. already prepared. Or if you have, if 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 you if you flag issues and concerns, and you have a thought about what a condition should read, that'll give me time to work on language and get to you within the next couple of days, so that you have a chance to That's review it. That's fine. And any additional. Um, That's fine. We'll do it that way. Yeah. Any additional conditions that you think should be uh, imported into. You know, we'll work on mm -hmm. those. Right, so and then in this, under the paragraph, determination of compliance with standards and grant permit, the last sentence uh, says, no construction shall deviate substantially from the requirements without the approval of the planning board. I think we might want to think about what our definition of substantially is. In my experience, that the building department had approved some changes that later the planning board, the thought should have come back to the planning board. Um, so it's just something for us to think about. So when that uh, back would read, no construction shall deviate from the requirements without the approval of the planning board. And then we determine whether it's an issue, but there are minor things too. Um, Again, it's maybe we could give an example of what we think is substantial or insubstantial and the, as a guide, but I don't have an answer. I just wanted to point yeah. it out as something for us to think about. They changed the material of the walls. <laughs> exactly. Or like yeah. a Goddard, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. They had that, the jagged... Right. Um, Hardy board. Right. That. Yeah. The was, shingles. Wasn't yeah. great. Yeah. But that probably would have been considered um, okay because yeah. it wasn't too right. substantially different. So, do we have a preference on how this should read? Um, but what, why don't we follow what materials. Cheryl had suggested earlier? Let's let's go through all of it, capture what we want, and then yep. go back and see okay. if we can. Because I would be more concerned about materials on that. All right, so that's flagged. Okay. <clears throat> all right on three. So traffic mitigation. Um, we had talked. Um, there were a couple of conditions that we had talked about with Sean Reardon. Um, and having so if you keep going um, in the document I yeah. kind of got caught into this too um, Meredith on number 15 it has conditions yes so this is just referring I think to the document is that in right general. Ned um, that the requirements include these particular right. plans but then later so you we can address adjust. conditions related to these it looks like I'm right. sorry yeah so uh, I'm just confirming that here you're just listing these as required document documents right. that are required to be uh, followed or right. enforced. Right. Mm -hmm. Later you have conditions related to these topics. Correct. Right. right. Okay. And the conditions sh should probably be cross referenced here. Cross cross referenced into the That's exhibit. That's what I was. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, so 
So I'll let you determine how that uh, cross-reference. Yeah, I was kind of struggling with how to manage that, but I think yeah, I have a... That I, would be helpful. I think I have a okay. better sense of it. Great. I think for all three of those, the so numbers two, three, and four. Right. Mm -hmm. Authorized development, I don't think I have anything. Did anyone have anything else on three? I mean, I think D is to, to be determined, but. Um, yeah, so move. in three. But in, yeah. But in this format, I think it's appropriate to leave mm -hmm. as is. Mm -hmm. And this does have any change to the architectural design of the building shall be subject to review and approval of the planning board. I'm sorry, where, which one are you Sorry, it, oh, on D. Oh, on D, okay. At the bottom of page three. But it does say prior to issuance of building permits. So that's That's a, good because that's right. when the building commissioner is reviewing the plans um, and comparing to the permit uh, because the plans that are submitted for the building permit mm -hmm. are going to be far more detailed if they choose to change, want to change something between <coughs> the time of this permit and the building permit, they would have to come back it, to us Correct. for that change. Like Walcott Woods asking to change their Correct. stone veneer right. to isn't the Isn't the, the challenge that what is the definition of any change to the architectural design? Mm -hmm. How do you define that? We'll come back to that. Yeah, we can come back to that, right? I think it ties to that. Um, it ties to um, the, this other one that we had in the determination and compliance. I have a couple thoughts on that. We can come back okay. to that. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> All right, so three, um, site plan design. Basically, these are reciting yeah. the, the, what we just went through on the zoning. Um, so are we like putting comments like the site layout takes into account the existing terrain? It really doesn't because we're bringing in 20,000 cubic yards of fill. So then it becomes whether it's that Subjective. balancing the intrusion into the wetlands because if you don't... It actually does take into account the site terrain because we're creating a, an area where construction is taking place and the rest of the site's being left alone and we're, and we're minimizing the impacts to the rest of the area by the use of these retaining walls. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the challenges <coughs> that I've, I've had is that by using the retaining walls, we have the walls, but then they're not disturbing. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have the walls, you'd have regrading and loss of more trees by more gradual. Um, what's been concerning is the height of some of those retaining walls. Okay, driveway and parking areas. Again, we'll. Yeah, so here, get into 13, we, I think we're going to get into parking. Yeah. We're going to come into materials later, I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on this. So I'm good with this. Yeah. Now we get into Space. open space and the... So are we discussing, like, if, if we approve or think that it's enough parking or if it's over-parked? You know, in other um, discussions we've had, we've talked about eliminating all these parking spaces. Every parcel, every lot is over parked. So, you know, again, it goes back to this project was sold as there would be, um, you know, no need, nobody was driving. Um, there'd be when people, employees were taking the bus, <coughs> taking the bikes, walking. So, you know, do we really need or should are we going to discuss the number of spaces, or is that a condition, you know, reducing the number of spaces? I, I can respond to that. 45 spaces is the number of spaces that will be developed on this site. Okay. Okay. We've been through that. Okay. It would cost us less money if we could do less, yeah. but we can't. Okay, so that's non-negotiable. Yeah. Right. Just to clarify. Oh, yeah. Excuse me, Madam Chair. 
Yes. Can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no. Since you're going through the, the draft. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. For the record, uh, Dan yes. Hill, I represent the neighbors. Um, since you're going through a draft approval decision, is it safe to assume that you guys have voted to approve the project versus deny it? Or? No, no. Okay, so is that gonna come after you go through the? Yeah, well, de there's definitely things in here which I, I, I personally feel are not ready, you know, that still need to be worked on. Yeah. So just, this is just highlighting what we need to improve on this. Okay, before we would get to that discussion. So yes, this is not. Because if you were gonna deny it, then it would be pointless to go through all these conditions. But. Yeah, I think we're, okay. we're still in the okay. modifying the project. Great, stage. thank you. So I thank you. Yep. I, don't, I don't anticipate any vote until we've gone all the way through it. Yeah. You determine whether or not it's properly conditioned. Right. Um, my experience with this board is that the last thing you do is take a vote. And yet also, kind of like I think about MBTA zoning, um, if for some reason, you know, say it passes, you would want all these conditions, I would think, in it to offer more protection, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why we're kind of going through it. Well, the if, idea, too, is can you mitigate the, the right. potential impacts through conditions beyond what they've already said that they have, have incorporated into their drawings. So, you know, to the point of you get to the end and you say, okay, does it meet the zoning? Um, has, have they mitigated the potential impacts to, um, you know, the neighborhood? Um, and is it providing for the public good, right? Which is one of the, the main things in the zoning in the beginning. But you can't answer it until you've kind of come to the end of your discussion with them, with the applicant on all of these matters, right? That's the way I see it anyway. I see it the same way for uh, Attorney Hill who asked the question. Um, I have 15 of my own conditions that I wrote and if what Ned has prepared doesn't include those conditions and uh, we, we either add or don't add, and I'm sure other members have their own conditions, but in my mind, this project will hinge uh, uh, for me on whether I accept or won't accept based on the conditions that are prepared. Um, so that's how I look at it. Um, I think this is a necessary process and uh, I could be satisfied in the end, or I may not be satisfied in the end. Okay, so we're on right, driveway so parking, or then we went to open space, right? Quick question yep. on parking. Yeah. Wasn't mm -hmm. there talk about using the hospital space across the street for holidays? That has been agreed to. Is that yeah. in here anywhere? I didn't see it. We do not have it in this because it would not be the applicants um, it, within their permit, but it would be maybe the hospital may provide a letter. I'm not sure where we... Well, what. I would think that that's they would, just just like I think Novara, I mean, uh, or Abbey Park, that's part of their special permit is their parking agreement with whoever. So yeah. I would think it would be in part that's of That's the reason why we're able to reduce the right, back parking right, exactly. spaces, right? right, no, I... Yeah. So yeah. what could, we could do okay. is that, that the parking... Um, any additional need for parking for special events um, will be accommodated off-site. I mean, we could put something like that because we don't want them to come back for an amendment to mm -hmm. add parking either. Well, the site is the site is at its max at forty-five. So somehow, so the question becomes whether there's some condition related to that off-site parking. Yeah, well, you could just require a lease. I mean, even if it's a zero-dollar lease, it would be part of um, the special permit. You'd have to provide a lease for Milton Hospital. Ned, how do you propose that this um, that this could be bound to the agreement that you have with the hospital?
Uh, let me come up, try to come up with some mm -hmm. solution to that. I understand that, and there is a draft of an agreement between okay. the, the developer and the hospital that memorialize, memorializes okay. the agreement. So um, how we reference that, you know, we can, we can work on. Yeah. Because the hospital has one with St. E's for their parking. Right. All right, so we'll need a reference to the hospital parking. Possible to make it sort of exhibit E or F, whatever the next exhibit would be. Okay. All right, great. Um, and open space, did anybody have a comment on that? I don't have any. Again, minor more conditions. I don't have any on that. Okay. Okay. Actually, I, I did on the last one, sorry, on C. Um, in some situations we've had a bond required for damage to trees that were um, agreed to be uh, protected. Do you have? that kind of requirement in with CONCOM for, or is CONCOM purely just you take, you're removing trees and you have a replacement? Because we have some that are in the protected zones, right? But you're pretty close to construction to some of the trees and some of the tree bases and the root balls, et cetera. You know, and I've seen now in my time on the board where we have a tree protection plan and then you, you go visit the site and you see equipment and um, parked right underneath the tree that the protection has not been put in place or, or enforced. And we all know that um, construction impacts for trees will show up later. Maggie, I'm taking your, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe some of what you've talked about, but in my experience too, like it'll show up about five years later and you end up with these large tree loss. So, um, so you know, incorporating it's a, that in the tree we, preservation. We had something very, you know, um, I thought strong in the Wolcott Woods um, protection and the tree protection plan there, um, and a requirement um, uh, on behalf, yeah, with respect to the developer to make sure that they were following through with every contractor and subcontractor um, and having a pre-construction meeting and going through these documents so that they uh, all were responsible for it. So um, I'll take a, a second look at the draft of the tree protection plan itself. It's five or six pages long. It's essentially word for word from what was in Walcott Woods. Um, I can't remember specifically, but it's pretty close. Okay. Um, I don't recall if there's a bond there, and I didn't get a chance to re I review I don't, that. I don't so. know whether okay. there was or not. Um, but it was and then tight. also if, like, the tree is supposed to be protected, if it's a 50-foot tree that was supposed to be protected, and then it wasn't, and then that 50-foot tree died, obviously we don't want it to be replaced with a 7-foot tree. No, it would be subject to paying into the fund administered by the Conservation Commission for the value of a 50-foot tree. But you have some areas that are open space outside of wetlands and, and CONCOM right. jurisdiction, that, so we would have mm -hmm. to cover um, in our decision, right? And there, it, there was a specific language on that, on the development off of Brushhold Road. Yeah, on Beechwood. I Beechwood. That's what I thought they because had. Because there was a beach. significant tree beech that tree died. Yeah. that died. And it died. And yeah. they cut the, the, mm -hmm. during construction. Um, and that, so if we could look at that maybe to see we had how a, that was. We had Woodmere too where, I know there are some trees that were flagged as, a, they weren't committing to being able to preserve but would make every effort to. So those mm -hmm. got a different color and got flagged and the, pre, the um, tree protection was pretty good there during construction, but they still had some, some troubles. Um, it's one of the things that I think is 
turned up as a problem on many construction sites on the, in my time on the board, so I would like us to make sure we mm -hmm. give it as much as we can. Agreed. Okay. So somehow incorporating a bond for tree protection plan. Okay. All right. Page five. So I, I would like um, the sidewalks to be concrete rather than asphalt. I think it's, it's the aesthetic looking up. Um, it's one of the few components in, of the design as you look up from, from Highland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the concrete is um, definitely more durable. So and my question on that, and, and I, yeah. Not about durability, but looks. At least that's, asphalt is black. And that's it, what it sort of it disappears. It disappears with the concrete. To me, that's more commercial looking. And it's white. I mean, could it be dyed concrete or stained concrete? Uh, it's just white. You know, it's, it looks like a road, not a driveway. That was my only concern as well on that. But um, I don't know. I kind of favor like Cheryl concrete. Yeah. I think it's substantial. It, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's um, there's a permanence to concrete that I prefer. I, I I understand what you're. I understand what your point. Yeah. So maybe Walcott the neighbors Woods, might have a preference. Walcott Woods has a. Um, our bylaws call. I mean, our standards, rules, and regs call mm -hmm. for concrete. Honestly, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so if it were a roadway. Um, it would, the requirements would be for concrete. I think it's in part for durability. It's better, um, honestly, if, if you look at concrete, I mean, uh, sidewalks around town, um, many of them are not accessible because the um, asphalt just has more yeah. movement in it. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, if you want to keep this accessible, um, it yeah. does have a slope. Um, so you also, mm -hmm. You know, you can texture the concrete for slip. So it's just yeah, and, a, I, and I totally get all that. Yeah. But this is still a driveway, not a road. Um, so I don't, you know, I understand the durability part of it. That was just an aesthetic point of view. I'm thinking about you have all these different materials. You have a, a fence to keep people from falling. You have a guardrail to keep vehicles from going there. You have a sidewalk, you have a curb, and you have a driveway. So the curb is granite, I believe. The granite mm -hmm. and the uh, concrete would blend together in terms of visual. And then, you know, it sort of separates your vehicle. That curve separates your vehicle from your pedestrian and everything else. Um, so even for, let's just say, somebody's a little bit visually more impaired, impaired that distinction between roadway and pedestrian zone um, you get that with that color distinction but I um, that's that's what that would be my yeah. preference yeah. all right maybe revisit that and just put, I appreciate that can you put a dye in it a stain you can. You can make it gray yeah. you can. Gray. can you that would difference. <clears throat> okay. All right, walls. <laughs> Several locations where retaining walls should be used. Um, I, I think the big issue here is the material discussion yeah. that we had earlier. Yeah. And um, I sent you a link to a manufacturer called Canigliaro, and okay. they use um, natural face stone on gravity block walls. Maybe you and Paul Avery could take a look at that. It's nice looking, it's nice looking yeah. walls. It's the same same type of wall, gravity okay. block, so big concrete block, and they just face them with natural stone. Can you send that to Tim so he can distribute to the other yeah. members too? That would be great. That might be the a possible solution that would help. Okay. So let's for now, take that last sentence and 
hit pause with that. Uh, front entry to the site. Front entry shall be framed with two stone pillars and curved stone walls on the site plan. The walls may incorporate a sign announcing the presence of the development. The sign may be eight foot tall and contain a max of 10 feet. Uh, it may be uplighted. So I completely appreciate you're doing the stone pillars, doing the stone wall at the front. My concern is this is still a scenic roadway, which is in a residential neighborhood. Um, I would like to see something more of and, and I, because I did say embedded, so it is embedded currently the way it's presented, but it just cries out for a commercial building. And um, what I would really like to see is if you could uh, have those stone pillars, put lanterns on top, so you feel like you're coming into a residential area, and somehow incorporate mm -hmm. the way Walcott Woods did, did a sign which um, would be a Vita, it would, could be a good size, but have something that's, that's etched in stone the way Walcott Woods is. I think that would be far superior to having something so commercial. And, um, you know, soft uplighting would be fine, but lanterns on top, I think it just gives it, um, incorporates on a stone pillar, it, it says residential, and it just would fit into Highland Street in a, far better way. We'll take a look. And do you think eight feet is too tall? And that was, I was gonna say, and that, it would, that size would be reduced because it would be, if you take a look at Walcott Woods, they have it in the pillar, it's in the post itself. So I think it could be really an elegant entry to this facility. The eight feet uh, and the 10 square feet just reflect what's authorized yeah. in the zoning. Yeah. So I would, uh, I would suggest taking those those sizes out. The front and entry, um, I guess this is where we could capture the cobble coming in. Yep. But I really would like that on the plan with dimension. I think it is yeah. on the plan. We know how far it is. Hmm? I think it is on, it's shown on the plan. We'll double check that. And not on the but civil drawings. At least I didn't see it on the, on Paul's drawings. It might be on the landscape plan, but there's no dimension. We'll there's double, no material we'll pulled check out. That. It's graphically there, I think. Um, it definitely yeah. should be dimensioned so okay. we know how much area it is. Yeah. I just think the Walcott Woods entrance is such a nice entrance off of a scenic roadway. It's just appropriate. It fits in. It's still a multifamily, you know, multi large development project, but it just, you don't, your eye isn't drawn. Um, it, it just fits in with the, the area. So, but yeah, and having the cobble on the plan is good. Okay, um, parking number 13. Actually, on walls, I just w wanted oh, to ask, there are retaining walls that are at the rear um, and south and, I guess, uh, west that are associated with uh, outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. Is that, are those ready rock too? My sense is that all of the retaining walls are ready rock. We can, uh, I we can, can understand certainly you're confirm not in the that. wetlands in those locations, so the logic for using those, I think, um, in those locations is different. So maybe it's cost, but um, I'll be interested to see what this other product besides Ready Walk is because I, you know, as, as much as you've talked about peaceful courtyards for residents, um, the, the, there are those lower levels where people are looking out at that retaining wall from their unit, um, which is and family members who come to visit, yeah. you know, sitting outside, it's, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I didn't have anything on parking. Um, so I guess this would be the area to do the per pervious, pervious that, pavement. Yeah. And is that a solid, how, explain that, because I, I don't love the pavers, but what are the options on that, just from? 
somebody well, who does per this. Pervious pavement is is actually um, asphalt. Yeah. And um, it's uh, it's a material that has voids in it. You know, okay. you look at most pavement, it's bound yeah. together tight with different sizes of aggregate, so it does um, it does tighten up. Um, the idea of pervious pavement is it has voids yeah. and it allows the water to, you know, to, to Yeah, permeate. absolutely. Yeah. I think that's great. And, the, you know, the issue that Ned brought up is, you know, it requires maintenance for it to continue to perform. That was one of the issues, certainly. Um, I think the reality of it is this is a low-use parking lot. Um, so it, w it shouldn't require as much maintenance as a lot that would have a lot of vehicle mm -hmm. changes daily. Um, and, you know, I think by the time a vehicle gets to that area of the site, they've already traversed a long drive, and whatever may have been on their tires as they came into the site could potentially okay. have been, you know, lost yeah. in the page. So there's some reasons that it might work. Um, there's definitely some maintenance mm -hmm. involved in it, but... Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think it, two things. One is obviously maintenance. The other is, you know, sometimes fluids leak off of, you know, oil and other fluids yeah. leak yeah. off of that, that that then goes into the ground mm -hmm. and can leach towards the towards the, the wetlands. These are outside of the at least the twenty five foot, I think maybe even outside of the hundred foot from the back wetland. I'll double check that. Um, so the other thing on this is um forest pavement is an infiltration practice and um, it then requires separation from groundwater and everything else. So um, the, the section on this is uh, fairly robust. Um, you know, there, there could be some implications of grading changes with doing that. It isn't just simply swapping out the paving material. Um, it could increase the earthwork and other project impacts. So it's, it's not just as simple as just putting down a different type of paving. There, would be some, there could be some implications to what, Paul? grading because it has a pretty there's a robust uh section of of courses that need to go underneath it to be compliant and then we'll have separation from groundwater and everything else so um it it <coughs> it's it's more it's more it's technically more complex than just changing changing out the pavement material yeah I'm, I'm aware of it paul i'm actually doing it this week on a project so um i'll take a look at it a further look it'd be good if we had sean here i know sean uh would want to we just spoke about stuff. it last week actually so. pardon me i think sean expressed some concerns about yeah. it last week but yeah. we can certainly I recall follow it too. up yeah, yeah i recall it yeah okay all right not to belabor it, but I'm just thinking at number 11, we're talking about the entryway. I think it would also be much better to have a symmetrical entryway where the two different walls, that also would draw attention to this project. So that cohesive, you know, if we could embed that sign and do something that's more symmetrical, I think it would be a nicer entrance. But um, just wanted to add that. But um, anything else on parking? Then let's go to lighting, and you had brought up a few questions, which um, yeah, so which are good. The the excuse me, the light fixture that's closest to Highland is, does that provide lighting um, at the crosswalk? I think we talked about there's a, a street light nearby, um, but. I just wanted to make sure there's adequate lighting at that crosswalk. Um, when I'm thinking wintertime conditions when it's dark at four o'clock or five o'clock when there might be a change in staffing. Uh, but on the conditions, um, I was thinking that um, you have here that the lighting at the rear lot would be turned off at from 11.30 to six. I'd like to suggest that all the rest of the lighting be dimmed down to 30% at, during that same, those same hours. If there was some need for security purposes to increase above 30%, maybe that could be on an occupancy sensor. Um, or 
the controls could be such that certain areas are a little bit different, maybe at the front door or an exit door than the rest of it. But I'm thinking in particular street lighting um, and parking lot lighting because, um, you know, Winter Valley and the hospital are nearby and their lights, street lights and overhead lights are on a lot. And it's a lot of nighttime lighting when we're, we're talking about dark sky, but it's, it's not, you say it's dark sky compliant, you're talking about an individual fixture, but if they're all, a, a bunch of these 14 foot high light fixtures um, running throughout the evening, it seems like we should dim those down. Um, so the last sentence of the proposed condition says the lights shall be dimmed except as necessary to provide safe access and egress for evening visitors and shift changes. Um, is there a... Dim to 30%. We, we can say dim to 30% except as necessary. And then is there, there a daylight sensor? It says sensors and dimmers, but the, are you talking about daylight sensor? I was thinking of. So it gets it's, it's a, turned a on. Slightly inartful way of addressing <laughs> the issue of sensors, but sen so that my understanding of how a sensor would work, they would sense a vehicle or a pedestrian approaching, and that that would then cause the light to um, turn on. One of the issues with sensors is what happens when critters are crossing um, because one of the things that the Conservation Commission requested is that we actually have a larger box culvert on the front in the first crossing which increased the height of the walls etc because they wanted to make sure that deer could cross between the 107 Highland property and get to around to the rest of the property uh, so we redesigned that culvert specifically to address the, the commission's concerns. Um, well, that's right. So said. Our, my assumption is there will be deer and other critters that may be otherwise touching off sensors. Well, that's why I said it. I don't think you need the street lighting, the parking lot lighting to be on an occupancy sensor. But okay. if you need it for security reasons, let's say at the courtyards or at the entrance, that Okay. Um, that I seems reasonable. And you, I, I'll work on some additional language. If you can shoot something through Tim to me, that would be great as well. And then just one other thing, it's just a photo sensor. So you can do these on the fixtures themselves or you can do it through a um, sort of an integrated system, like a, a wireless system. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if uh, Sashi, who has ever helped prepare the, the lighting, the photometric plan, could speak to their um, Okay. The contact about that, they should be able to come up with a uh, suggestion for these uh, controls. But the idea on all of this is really on energy consumption that we don't need these parking lot lights and street lights on at times when they're not needed. If so that's where the. Parking back there. Hmm? If no one's parking back there, I mean, are we sure that no employees are going to be using that back parking lot? Yeah, we're, we're, we're agreeing to that as a condition okay. from the permit is that no, the third shift will park by the building. Um, and that the rear parking lot would be vacant. Totally at night. empty. Totally empty. Okay. But the other part okay. is just on this, um, this photo cell or on this, these controls is to have the uh, lights timed with daylight, you know, so that they turn on when it's dark and turn off when it's No, I understand it all, and I'm not yeah. a, I'm just concerned about security. If my daughter were yeah. working there and she had to leave in a, in a dark parking lot. I'd sure. Okay. Concerned because we're saving energy. So, and this is Sashi, just to yeah. say that the, the lights will have a photo cell sensor. So in daylight, they will be, they'll turn off automatically and they can be uh, wired in to respond to whatever needs to happen, whether it's turning them off or dimming them. They have all the capabilities of doing uh, those, those things. So I didn't see that feature as being included on the cut sheet. I looked at that um, today. So if you could just um, provide that language, Sashi, to Ned for a condition, we can cover it there. Okay. And just you mentioned um, the employee count of 25. So would the condition be there will be no more than 25 employees per shift? I'm not sure I can agree to specific maximum counts. Those numbers might change for different reasons. Um, but. 
generally speaking, we're, we're pretty close to what the employee counts would be. And those employee counts also include like any physical therapy or occupational therapy, like extra services that are needed? No, if those were contracted by a specific occupant or their family, that would be on top of employees. And so there's no way of knowing how many um, occupants will need those additional services. So even though, you know, you've said the traffic would be 288, it could actually be more than that because you don't really know, um, you know, what's, what client is going to need what services at any one time. So there's, you know, that's... Occasional, yeah. additional. I think the highest volume of staff would be in the building between t noon and three, roughly 35 employees. And I just wanted to just the the um, the example of the lighting that was that will be on the 14 the taller uh, 14 foot poles, um, which has a sort of a gooseneck um, hanging over. My experience in seeing those is they tend to lose the black, um, the, the paint or whatever. Um, um, I know Finish. they use what like a, finishes? yeah, what is the product? It's, it's um, that they would be sprayed with. Like the enamel or the paint? It's like an enamel. It, well, it can, yeah. it can vary. But I really like the lighting that Walcott Woods did because it doesn't have that gooseneck. It doesn't have all of that surface area that just when it starts to, peel and chip it just looks cheap you know you've seen it I, I you know you see it all over you see it in the lower mills area where they you drive in and just they look awful it just looks awful and I um, if it could be considered to do something and I just sent Ned um, a spec of the, uh, the the lighting that was done on the streetway at Walcott Woods it would, it would really enhance the project I think So I'm just advised by the client that um, that those additional services are included in the traffic count. Okay, cool. And that, I mean, um, Tim, I will send this, um, just this lighting, just to let the others um, take a look too. So if you could share it with the board. Anything else on lighting? Most timing and that having dim, those are all good um, good additions. So yes, traffic deliveries, which we're on. Um, Ned was just bringing up. The two deliveries. We have here between 10 and 2 p.m. So no, this doesn't, this doesn't indicate the Monday to Friday commitment that you spoke of earlier. We can add that. And it, and it doesn't also indicate the number of deliveries that you mentioned earlier. Is it possible to do that? Sure. So number of deliveries in the days. Okay. Which was two, no more than two. Be two deliveries day. Okay. And the size of the tractor trailers. Prohibited from us. All right. We've gone over these conditions for employees. Um, is there any? Yeah, I um, was wondering whether we should include a requirement that allows um, the building commissioner upon request to view these documents and mm -hmm. videos so that if the building commissioner is receiving complaints that there's uh, he has access to documentation yeah. he or she has ac access to documentation okay 
And then what happens if, um, is there a fine? Yes, $250. Where is that? Uh, that is, that, there is a, it's in here somewhere. That's under the construction management. Oh, I think just yeah. in, in Was that just, oh, there, okay. Yeah. So is that, st will that be, um, would be applied for employees and deliver, you know, anybody leaving the site? Well, that fine is only listed under mm -hmm. construction right. management. It's not listed under this. Yeah, so do we put it under there? A fine to the business, right? To the business, correct. Because the special permit yeah. is going to the business. So just, um, I, I know Nick, you, you obviously talked a little bit about how do you manage compliance with this, right? Um, I just want to think through that for a minute. So who who is reviewing the surveillance? Well, the, I would think, I think it's management, staff. right, at the business. But then let's say there's complaints. Then the building commissioner should be allowed to request to view that these um, documents that they've asked the employees to sign and any videos where they're recording the um, truck activity, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, that's what's required here. Because the building here. commissioner is the, yeah. is the code enforcement officer. Right. Agreed. So, so uh, is there a period of time that the surveillance should be maintained for? Probably. They override them, right, every, probably every 30 days. Can you look into that, Ned? Because yep. I, I think I think it could be a situation where someone may have a complaint and the surveillance from that particular day is no longer available. If you could help us understand how that's going to work. Sure. Okay. All right. So if I understand what you're asking is that the there be a condition that the building commission would have the ability to request copies of surveillance that so such surveillance should be maintained for x amount of time and be available and then with respect to any violation observed within the surveillance it would be a fine of 250 dollars i also <coughs> thought that the um just to have an assurance that these uh, um, these forms are being actually prepared and signed by employees, that those should be those records should be kept and available to be viewed as well. Yeah, so yeah. we should probably get into like a registration or a plate number, right? Because the way I see this happening is the same little blue Honda takes the right and goes down Spafford every day. The neighbors say, "Hey, this car keeps coming down the street." I'm sure they're working at the hospital. They complain. They pull a video. You can link it to an employee. The fine is levied. I mean, that's the way I see it. Yeah, so agreed. And yeah. and the surveillance would show whether or not that little blue Honda was going out the driveway, taking a ride, right. and then showing up on Spafford. And right. To Cheryl's yeah. point, if you have documentation of the employee and maybe their right. their registration, you can put it to bed. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a way to be able to enforce in a condition. That otherwise, how do you enforce, right? Right, right. So in my permit, I have um, a review of required records. And it's stated the following records shall be kept you know, in the sales office and shall be made available for inspection and copying by the building commissioner and or his designee at the building commissioner's request. Records shall be updated on a regular basis as relevant information is received or changed. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Not the exact language, but I remember that yeah. it was there. Yeah, I think a reasonable amount of time for you know for the for the 
for the building inspector or anybody would be 30 days if they could maintain it for 30 days that you know I mean if you can't, if you can't manage it within 30 days right. or no one has complained within 30 days I, I don't know how uh, I don't know what's possible and if there is a fine what does a fine get paid to maybe it should go to the traffic mitigation fund mm -hmm. yeah yeah that any fine sense. yeah yep. okay so with your required records, do you give them your registrations and your license number, uh, plate numbers? Um, Is that like a they privacy have, thing? They have a list of all my trucks. Okay. Uh, and then on this um, next condition, are we ready for that? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, to pay the town's cost to adjust the timing. Um, and then make this contribution of five thousand. I think it should be more than five thousand. Well, the the way the mitigation fund is set up, the, the the maximum payment is based on the number of parking spaces. So there's forty five parking spaces at three hundred and fifty dollars per space. That's thirteen thousand five hundred. That's the maximum that the board could impose for mitigation, which would include presumably the cost mm -hmm. of um, adjusting the timing mechanisms, which we estimated about $5,000 per. So with the additional amount, if there would be speed bumps were gonna be added to spaffold So road. you are looking at some conditions here where in addressing one of the largest issues that we've heard about for two years, and you're telling me that you can't go above what the minimum or the maximum required in that particular section of the bylaw. I'd like you to reconsider that. Okay, but I'm but at the same time, you're asking me to mitigate somebody else's problem. And we're not creating the problem of the existing traffic. We're, we're, I know we're that committed to work with the hospital to try and help the hospital figure out how to mitigate its traffic. There's no traffic generated today Correct. on this property. There will be traffic generated by this use. And the degree to which that is going to have an impact on neighbors is not, there's not agreement on. But I think everyone could agree that going from zero to a new use is something, right? I, I don't disagree with that, yeah. but we don't trigger any of the thresholds that require payment of mitigation, right? We don't decrease the level of service. Right. We don't increase the volume of traffic by more than 5%. Um, the level of service on uh, the, 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 the on Well, it's hard Island to Street. decrease something from F to F. No, to it, be on but F, you have to go from one to another. And we don't, we don't change the level of service from one to the next. My, my point is that there's a level of service is so low that you can't drop it any lower, then you're not going to have a change in level of service. But, but, the, but the alternative to that is, are we increasing the volume of traffic by more than 5%? And the answer is no. That's an either or calculation. So this comes down to the, the question of um, mitigation and whether impacts can be mitigated. And $5,000 doesn't go very far in, in doing a study. The residents are interested in sort of a broader traffic study. $5,000 is not going to get very far. So um, I'd like for you, as I said, to consider it further. I'll consider a specific number. I really need, I, I'm not going to negotiate against myself here, so I, I don't know really how, what to do, I think. The board needs to, to determine what they think is appropriate, and we need to react to that. Well, you mentioned, the, it, you know, it's sort of like the vernal pools. You, you know, technically, you know, you accepted those when you didn't need to, which I appreciate. Um, the, you said 13,500 would be the number calculated? If you, if, if, that's the threshold? If, if you follow the requirements of the traffic mm -hmm. mitigation, yeah. and I don't think it's been used yet. I may be incorrect, but the calculation on what the maximum amount to pay into, assuming you trigger trip thresholds, is um, for a commercial property, it's three hundred and it's four hundred three hundred fifty dollars per.
parking space, or 450, whatever the number is, times 45, it's $13,500. That's the maximum right. that you have the authority under that, under that mitigation, traffic mitigation bylaw to impose. So, so do we the want to suggest a number? The question well, about whether it's been... times 45 is 15,750. I just, I'm going to respond first to the yeah. question about whether it's been used before. 440 Granite Ave came to us for site plan approval, and part of that was a voluntary contribution to, the, to this fund um, as part of the uh, decision for that particular project. Um, sorry, what was the three, calculation? It's $300 per Oh, 300 oh. I, I misspoke. So, um, so we're not we're not saying we shouldn't be we we're not saying no you can't impose it and we're agreeing to make a payment but the payment has to be reflective of what the town put together when it created the traffic impact mitigation bylaw. Which you just same. can't you just can't go off in some other area that's arbitrary because you think we should do more. Well, I mentioned that this other project did a voluntary contribution to address a concern that was expressed by neighbors, and that's what I'm asking you to consider here, given the concern that's been expressed about the matter. But as far as the board's concerns, you know, other members feel as strongly as I do about it, you can chime in, or if you think that, um, you know, this number should be 5,000, or if you think it should be more. I think it should be more. Yeah. I think and you're right. Maybe it, we can be criticized for being arbitrary or not, right? And, and we may very well be, but. 10,000? Well, how much was 440? We'd have to no, look to was, see before we assign something. 440 was 10,000. I don't recall the number. We'd have to, yeah. I'd have to, check, have to that. check that. Maybe we just need what to we, review what let, other. Let, what, let's think about it. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. OK. And how did you land at 5,000? I assume $5,000 per intersection. There's two intersections where the timing sequences the have to be adjusted. We understand the cost yeah. associated with doing that work, including police details and whatever is about five thousand dollars per intersection, and we added five thousand, so that mm -hmm. gets you to fifteen thousand, a little mm -hmm. bit more gotcha. than what would be covered under the traffic mitigation um, bylaw. But that's that's how we we arrived at that. Okay, and you assume that they have to be adjusted once. The, the recommendation coming from the traffic, our traffic consultant was that they should, that each of those signals should be resequenced. It's, it's, it's a matter of a, a technician going out and taking out and re. I understand see, what it is, but it's going to yeah. happen once or twice, yeah. or what do you think? I assume it would happen. Shot? I'm assuming it happens once and it's done, done properly. And um, is that DPW staff that does it? I, I don't know. Probably. Uh, I mean, if it is, there's really, it's just an assuming expense that DPW, that's already included in the town budget. Assuming that, that, that DPW has the staff capability of doing that, I don't know if they have to use contractors to do that. But even if it's done once, you're paying for the 5000 right? right? It has to get done again to make, because I see you guys adjusting intersections all the time, the same ones. So if it happens twice, that's 10 right? But you're not paying for the second. Correct. adjustment We'd but I, I'm just trying to yeah no we would we would we would, we would pay to adjust each under the under the purview of the DPW once right. so I would suggest that we find out whether the DPW does these adjustments with staff that they have or is there any expense related to it because unless it's an outside contractor I doubt what's the expense that's related to it yeah, and it's the bigger question I have, and this is not really you, but it needs to be consistent. So, for instance, like fines are kind of a big thing. I was fined $1,000 because I started a piece of machinery 15 minutes before my start time, and I was fined $1,000 for failure to notify um, the building commissioner on having a truck on site. So there is inconsistency in fines across the town and in my experience it was left up to the building inspector to negotiate the fine so um, just that's a, a bigger issue that maybe we need to kind of look at at some point okay 
So let's let's just think on that and maybe see what we did for 40. Mm -hmm. Grin it up. Tim, do you recall? What's the question? Do you sorry? Do you recall what the what the um, traffic mitigation uh, um, amount was that was paid into the fund by 440 Granite? Not off the top of my head. I can try to grab that though. Okay. Yeah, if you happen to come up with, we're just and the have, rationale. What yeah. was the rationale for? And it? have there been any other payments into the fund? I guess was the other question. Yeah. I think the only other project that's paid into that fund is Walcott Woods. And I, I, I believe that that was commensurate with the um, with whatever's in the regulations in the bylaw. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure that that's right, but we should double check it because I think Walcott was permitted uh, was permitted before the traffic mitigation uh, bylaw was put in place. I remember we in that case uh, Walcott Woods agreeing to traffic signage That's what I was say. and other things that were those speed yeah you know um, shadows Monitors. and different things but um, we didn't I don't remember addressing the issue of the of the traffic okay. mitigation bylaw because I don't think it had been adopted yet okay. all right so moving on to 16 Ooh. construction management plan and project phasing we talked a little bit about things that we may want to add to that. Um, condition. Submit so copies. did we have, um, I need to re-review the plan, but is there a prohibition on construction workers parking on the ladder streets? And is there a fine associated with construction workers if they're found parking there? There is not, but there's no reason why there shouldn't be one. Okay. Okay. And I was, the restrictions that are put up in for truck traffic, uh, I'm concerned about the number of trucks related to construction, particularly the tree removal and the cut and fill. And I'm concerned about truck traffic, particularly during school time, so when students are on their way to Milton High or the Pierce, um, and also on their way home. So I'd like to have a limit in the construction management plan to when they, those trucks can be active. Time of day. Mm -hmm. And perhaps not on weekends? No, there's no construction on weekends. No construction, because I, I know we talked about that before. Okay. There may be some interior dis construction once the building is. Right, okay. But nothing exterior. But nothing outside. Sean, do you have any um, thoughts or suggestions about that with respect to what the industry expects? Um, specifically to hours limitation. Yeah, uh, trucking. Pardon me. Trucking, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. This is this is a difficult site to truck to. Mm -hmm. Really difficult. Um, I mean, it's not just <clears throat> cut and fill. It'd be concrete and others, but the 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 tree removal and the cut and fill are is going to be substantial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The earthwork phase um, is probably the most substantial. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, the, twenty thousand. I'm concerned right. about residents. Have said they're concerned about safety. Yeah. I know that if you restrict the hours, you're lengthening the duration, right? Because if you're doing less than one day, it's going to take you longer to do the total job. So that's a factor in doing the limitations. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you could stretch the project out if you create too many limitations. Um, I think would probably be best just to let the hours of the, of the construction be what hours of construction are, you know, by, you know, our town construction set hours and not restrict it. 
So I, you wouldn't agree to restricting, let's say, a start of 9 o'clock? That's what I was thinking, 9 a.m. If I live next door, I'd want it done as quick as possible. But you also don't want to be driving your children. You don't want children walking to school, driving, you know, teenagers. My son bikes down that road every day from Center Street to the school. Yeah. I mean, I... Well, I know. This just adds... They're probably the safest vehicles on the road. Trucks coming to, to and from the site. Yeah. I just yeah. saw the so truck that's removing the trees on the pro that site on Central. It's a big truck with a lot of big tree trunks on it. And we're talking about how many hundreds of trees here? So that, and that, coming that'll, in and out? That'll happen fairly fast. I mean, that, that'll happen within a couple of weeks. I understand your point. I, I don't know. I think I'd want to think about it a little bit more. Um, ironically, the best time of the day, you know, to avoid children is earlier, but I understand what you're saying. If you go to 9 o'clock, if you 9 to 2, you could really restrict the, uh, the hours of, yes. of um, you know, vehicle traffic to and from a site. If a typical construction site would be 7 to 3, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the high school starts at, what, 8? So you could, maybe you could do 8.30, maybe 8, but 7 o'clock seems to me prime time. Between 7 and 8 would be prime time for lots of people mm -hmm. going to and from school. Did you propose hours for, no. for, for construction traffic? No, only for uh, deliveries. Yeah. Paul? Can we ask you what is your what has been your experience with in residential areas? Bringing is there a time that has worked? And I don't know how many truckloads we're talking about for twenty thousand cubic yards of fill. But yeah, I think there's some guidance on that in the construction management plan. That isn't really my expertise, um, you know. And but I mean, it is um, fairly common to restrict hours to, you know, reasonable hours for projects in residential neighborhoods. I mean, that happens all the time yeah. for exactly these reasons. So, like you know, I, if, if we, if we change the traffic flow, so it only came down Randolph Ave, you know, all of the construction traffic, how would you feel about that? That way you're keeping it off of Canton Ave and probably away from a lot of the foot traffic. For, but, for whatever hours but it but is. But if you go down Randolph, you're going to go to Reedsdale to Canton Ave, right? And have to make the left onto Highland. Yeah. you got to come up there. Um, it's either that or make a left at the lights at the old dump entrance. And I really feel like that's really going to be hard to manage. Like, I yeah. know I can probably beat up the applicant pretty good, but um, I think to be honest with you, all the truck drivers want to come in at 7. They're in and out quick. My concern is the number, like 20,000 cubic yards of fill. So Sean Reardon said it's 20 yards per truck. I get in 50 um, yards per truck. So even if it's 50 cubic yards per trailer, so that's 400 truck loads to equal 20,000 cubic yards. Um, so so um, the estimate for the net volume of fill, so trees is a different issue, yeah. and other materials coming in is a different issue, but just for the net volume of fill, 11,500 cubic yards, it's um, 20 cubic yards of material per truck, that's approximately 575 truck trips required, um, anticipate a 19 work week, 19 week period working five days a week. That's um, six trucks per day delivering. Thank the, good. They the can start field. at nine. There's plenty of time for them. So but staging those, tr you know, those okay. trucks in, in, a, in, a, in the way the site's built out, they're going to be coming periodically. Um, I can, t I can, Wait, we can check with the contractor on, yeah, the, on the issue of the, of the delivery of fill, whether or not they can live with a. Find it. With a, with a stricter time frame. Um, now, could you repeat the amount of fill that you're stating? How many cubic yards? The net cubic yards, most they're going to reuse as much as they can on site. They won't be able to use all, obviously. But the, the net amount of, of fill is 11,000, approximately 11,500 cubic yards. Okay. 
okay, divided by 20, which is 20 cubic yards per truck, mm -hmm. is 575 truck trips. They estimate 19 weeks um, working five days a week, total of 95 days, 575 divided by 95 is an average of six per day. Some days it'll be a little more, some days it'll be less, but it'll be a quote approximately. Now that's just, that's just fill. That doesn't deal with trees, that doesn't right. deal but with concrete, that doesn't deal with block, that doesn't deal I'm, with other I'm stuff. I'm looking at the April 3rd um, letter. It's, it's entitled the Earthwork Memo. Okay. I'm and it, off of another one. it says, uh, Fill 20,369 cubic yards on page uh, 4. Okay, we'll, That's the number that. We'll we'll, the we'll number you're talking that. about says net remaining net fill import slash export. So, but so what, what this does was this just looks at, you know, the earthwork for the earthwork's sake. And so when you look at the table on this, um, we just looked at the gross volume difference. And then, you know, there's there's fill that's necessary to change the grades. But then, you know, of that material, sort of the net volume change, there's a certain amount of this that's, you know, are select materials. In other words, you're going to need to bring in, you know, pavement. You're going to need to bring in the gravel base courses for the pavement, no matter what you do here. Um, you know, there are... Uh, underground drainage systems and all these other things we broke out. So basically, you know, it's the 11,496, 11,500 cubic yards. That's the amount of fill that's required to basically, that's the cut fill in balance. It's, it's net positive on that too. Uh, uh, you know, how much material I have to bring in, you know, for the purpose of fill as opposed to construction, if, that, if you can understand what I'm saying. So, Paul, are you saying that that's the import, 11,500, and the rest of the earthwork volume is actually on site and just... Yeah. So, so that if you looked at this whole thing and you just, you know, the, if you're looking at the, the table on, I think it's the third or fourth page, third page three of six on this thing, if the summary just goes, you know, here's, here's the gross cut and here's the gross fill, so there's the net cut fill, that's just looking at the the difference between the existing and the proposed volume services, okay? And then, you know, we say, okay, you know, what we have to do, we have building slabs, we have pavements, we have all these things that we listed out in the next part of the table. So that of that, you know, you're bringing in, you know, 4,100 cubic yards of select materials that just need to be brought in anyway because they're specific base materials and things like that. Um, and so then, you know, the net import for, for just, you know, I mean, all those materials need to come in in trucks, too. So for the purpose of, of you know, what are the trucks, um, you know, that you probably need to look at the gross, you know, cubic yardage on this thing. You know, it's just like what Ned was saying, you know, there's concrete, there are a lot of other things that can need to come in. But, you know, this, this exercise was prepared um, because, it, you know, the board requested that the engineer do an earthwork takeoff, so that's what this is. Mm -hmm. I think one of the one of the issues that you'll face, um, Ned, is it won't stretch out. Earthwork normally wouldn't stretch out over five months. You know, that's six trucks per day. I, I understand the math. If Erlen said 19 weeks, 575, you do the simple math. But that phase of earthwork, and when you think about filling, you know, to put that roadway in, that's going to be a surge of trucks when that is happening. And it'll be a it'll be a lot more than six per day because what'll happen is six trucks will dump within two hours, and then the site guy's dead for the rest of the day if he doesn't have a constant flow of trucks. So maybe you could ask Erland again, you know, how, how that'll happen. I suspect that when earth work when uh, import is coming to the site, you're just going to get a huge volume of it in a in a period of time. It won't be stretched out like that over 19 weeks. So that's one would really have a concern because there'll be so much truck traffic. And I, I don't know how much analysis went into what the existing soils are and if they're actually reusable as uh, structural fill. Um, I think a lot of it is kind of clay based, which wouldn't be structural fill. So um, I don't think there's been a geotechnical report done here to tell us 
uh, some of this. Um, so I think it's probably well, going to be more that rather than less in terms of the number of trucks that are required. Paul, is there are there test pits done on the site? Yeah, we did test pits um, for um, drainage, you know, for stormwater purposes, and then there was a geotechnical report as well that, that characterized the soils. I mean, I, I Cheryl's point is is valid that I don't think that material is suitable for structural fill, um, but I mean I do believe that a lot of it is would be suitable for you know just borrow material in certain areas of the yeah. site. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in just um, on that, if we're getting all that truck traffic in a short amount of period of time, where are all the employees, the construction guys going to park? Are they going to be parking along Highland Street? So then, um, you know, even just, I know my neighbor has undergone this project right on the corner, you know, for the past four, five, six months, and it's been a challenge for me to get my trucks in. I'm always asking them to move their, their trucks out of the way. Um, I so think we put there's no parking on Highland. No. And if there's not enough adequate parking on site, they'll have to do some kind of off-site parking arrangement and get people mm -hmm. over there. That's what happens in the cities all the time or in really tight sites. So, um, you know, this is going to take, a, what, at least a year to build. You can't expect that these uh, construction workers are going to park and make the traffic problems far worse than what they yeah. already are. There's no room to park on Highland. No. So no. that would be or the condition. Or the, or the latter streets. Yeah. There have to be the hospital parking lot yeah. somewhere. Um, that, that, even that's unlikely because that part, the hospital parking is full during the week. Mm. Yeah. So they, they will have to stage their parking, employee parking elsewhere and, and carpool. Um, but certainly no construction worker parking allowed on Highland or the latter streets. No problem with that. Cool. So is that, so that will need to be put into the construction management plan? Yep. Should, should we, I, I know you say Highland and the latter streets, should we just say not on any of the public streets? Yeah, I don't know where you, I w don't know where you would park. I know that's what yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, I think right? thinking, that, yeah. yeah, because there's no place to park on Canton Avenue. There's no place to park on Reedsdale Road. There's no place. Well, there are some parking spaces on Canton Avenue, uh, opposite Town Hall. Those are striped as curbside to the library. Um, okay. But there's those um, are intended to be used for the library as well. Well, maybe um, um, so. the town of Milton could rent some spots at DPW. Yeah, or the church. Well, then the town gets it if it's at DPW. You get All right. That. Yeah, what concerns me, if we don't say that, we'll have Wendell Park full with cars. You know, right. I mean, construction workers will find any place to park a car. Um, yeah, that, that, I'll work on a, on a, on a business. On I, public I, roads. I hear the, yeah. I hear the concern. That's okay. If, yeah, I think at DPW would be great if they could make an arrangement there if they have room. They do. Okay. <clears throat> now that that uh, our, uh, paragraph seventeen, I think some of the language in there really belongs in sixteen. You know, when you get to that last couple of sentences, the applicant shall maintain and submit copies of such surveillance with the building commissioner and town planner on a monthly basis. The applicant shall pay a fine of 250. I think that's part of 16, not 15. No, I'm sorry, 16, not 17, isn't it? Uh, I'm looking yep. at my copy. It is I don't in see 16 it on 17. And mine. I see it on 16. Hmm. Do you not see it in 17? I see it in 17. No. <laughs> I have a few. How many sevens do we have? <laughs> unless so you have I another. We have a few. Unless there's, there's, there's an, another draft. thing. With Probably 17 is utilities, water, and sewer. Might be from this draft. Uh, this yeah, is a, no. four, a draft that was 4 12 24. Yeah, that's the one I'm, I'm on. I'm on 4 5. I'm on 4 5. <laughs> oh, yeah, I 4 5. It, that's, uh, but, no, this is 4 <laughs> 10. I don't know how you ended I've, up with 4 5. Pretty impressive I'm that we're still getting 10. it done. <laughs> I have 4 10. This 4 is good. It's been pretty consistent, though. <laughs> well, he added the conditions under from Sean under the stormwater. I don't know if there were other changes. Okay. But, yeah. Two more pages, people. Two more pages. 4 10. I have 4 10. Okay. 
But they should they should be in the proper sections. I, I agree with that. It might, it might be That's in the 410. They're definitely Here's in the 410. The 410. Yeah. It's in 16 and 410. Yeah, it is. I see it there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, because it came Friday. No, it's not an issue. Yeah. Right. I think it came Friday. Is that right? What's that? that uh, I think it was Friday. Yeah. Friday, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's check that. Yeah, those few, the Sean's conditions. That... Okay. Are we ready to move mm -hmm. to 17? Utilities, water, and sewer. Um, and this, this is flagging a question based on um, our citizen speak um, comment. Halfway down, the water and sewer lines shall be installed in accordance with town specifications. So I think that should be verified. Um, they would, if the DPW doesn't find their plan satisfactory, they won't get the permit. Correct. So, I, I mean, that I think this sentence, it, you know, that's the process that mm -hmm. happens. The DPW uh, makes that decision, mm -hmm. that determination. I don't know. I think this sentence, uh, I just wonder, you know, it's... It, it may need to be changed a little bit. The water and sewer line shall be installed in accordance with the town specs. You know, that, that, that sometimes refers to, you know, a pipe, you know, a connection. You, you know, I, I wonder if there's a word other than specifications that should be used. You could say standards and or subject to town DPW approval. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That sounds better. Yep. It's still uh, um, to be determined by the DPW. That's their jurisdiction. So the rules and regulations um, is fine, but it, it still flows through the DPW. Mm -hmm. okay. Did anyone have anything else on this? I'm good. I'm good with that. Okay. Drainage storm water management. This is where I adopted, I did incorporate yep. the recommendations that came from Sean. Right. And so, yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> this initial funding um, of 5,000. Yeah. Is, is that up there, Tim? Yeah. It's at the top um, of page seven. <clears throat> so that's under allowing for a third party inspection of the stormwater system installation. And I thought Sean said it should be checked monthly. Like it should be a, like a, not just like a one time, but a, um, a periodic. So I, I wanted to follow up with him on how frequently that third party um, inspection of stormwater management systems during the installation phase should be made. Because it, so he mentions there's a minimum. If you look, there's sort of three, right? The bottom. That's um, that's the minimum. Yeah. And then prior to backfill, of major systems, and then periodic. So, you know, you could say um, not to be less than a certain number of visits. I suppose if you want to make sure that there's the, how many periodic really means. So we know that he's already outlined two. Right. So that, I thought, let's, let's table that and just ask Sean about that. Or maybe we can get that answer. Um, yeah, so in mine, um, early next week. I have a condition that I have to provide an annual report 
shall be submitted to the town engineer document, documenting the maintenance of the system. I think that's the third condition. That's, that's and the Maggie, third. Yeah. Um, I had also uh, a report for the effective, effectiveness of the drainage 12 months and 24 months after completion. So those are... Mm -hmm. Well, I like the... 24 month, 12 month, and in, in fact, yeah. the effectiveness because I that was something that I think I mentioned, um, making sure that it's um, functioning as designed and as anticipated. That's sort of that idea I, I said of commissioning. Um, so this has a 12 on an annual basis. Um, the, the, there's two different. I mean, there's, yeah. there's two different types of um, inspections. One is one is uh, you know oversight of the installation right. during construction. That's number one. That's what's covered under the first condition. Yeah. Then it's following the completion of installation, and then it's an ongoing maintenance. So there's three. Right, so the second one is upon completion. And then the third is the maintenance. Second one's also prior to the issuance of an occupancy permit. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just was going to add, uh, under, after the 5000 to cover the cost of the basic um, inspections, assuming the work is ex executed organized in an organized way, otherwise additional funding may be required. That seemed open-ended on who was it may be required, but who's going to pay it? So I just thought to be paid by the applicant maybe should be added on that. Or added. Because that $5,000, if additional funding is required, specifying yeah, it be, it, the town's required not required of the applicant. But yeah. Clarify yeah. that. that was, yeah. I, I just adopted Sean's okay. language. I didn't. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yep. I, I don't think $5,000 is going to go very far at all. It normally doesn't. No. You know, mm -hmm. It goes, exactly. it'll go nowhere. No. Um, I, I, you know, I actually feel like what it should read is the applicant shall allow for and fund third party, third party inspection of stormwater management system and all earthwork activities because they're part of it. You know, the, the earthwork and the stormwater, they, they, they work together. Um, that's really what the oversight should be. It's, it's, a, it's the, the geotechnical part of the site, you know, um, is really what should be asked for. And I don't think it should be a technical consult designated by the board. We, we, we don't want that responsibility for designating who it is. You know, that should be the project team's responsibility. You uh, want it to be independent of the project team, though, don't you? It should you? be, yeah, but it should be, you know, Paul probably works with plenty of geotechnical consultants, you know. How about by, um, just approved by the board, that mm -hmm. way? Not approved by the DPW director. By the DPW director, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Think, I, don't, I don't think we have expertise to, apport, to approve a geotechnical person, and we shouldn't take that responsibility, but it, it should be somebody qualified and it shouldn't be our responsibility to do it. I'm not even sure the DPW would want that, but, you know, uh, that responsibility so, either. So for earthwork and things like that, there, you know, compaction, there'll be specifications in the construction documents, this, there'll be specific requirements and compaction. Um, and on projects like this, it's not atypical to have, you know, testing service people come in and they would just sort of do that as, you know, just a matter of, standard practice so um you know those reports could be made available yeah i mean i would expect for a project of this size that northbridge would would have an independent testing agent mm -hmm. and, and probably a geotechnical you know but both of those parties are important to make sure that this investment they're making is, they'll be is, required to yeah, by the building yeah. code and it, building officials anyway it, and maybe the lender if they have a lender involved in it so i, I think this needs a little bit of work Ned, a little bit there'll, here. There'll be submittals on materials, you know, to make sure, like, and I'm just talking about the site work here, that the yeah. materials conform to specifications in terms of gradations, mm -hmm. you know, and there'll be, you know, in situ compaction testing and things like that. I mean, all that stuff is, is 
standard spelled out in the specifications um, just as a matter of practice so just because of the importance of this having that be another peer review is basically mm -hmm. what this is so I if Sean you believe like the whole earthwork aspect of it then maybe there should even be a peer review of the specifications that come in on the final construction documents mm -hmm. I mean this um, is cr this is one of the critical I would, issues I would ask Sean whether he thinks that's warranted or not um, mm -hmm. okay you know that, that's I, I'd ask him I have a feeling how he might respond but I'm not going to try to speak for him and the last thing that we just didn't we discussed was a bond. I put a call into Chase Berkeley um, on if the system, for whatever reason, is not functional. If it's you know, if there is an issue, just as a recourse to have some sort of a bond, um, just during the construction phase, and also with the amount of trucks coming in, um, it could be incorporating a small section of. Um, Highland Street, if there's damage to the roadway with coming in and out, just that there would be a bond, as we typically would do, um, to be released once not, satisfactory. I'm, I'm not aware of any bonds that are required for the protection of public ways. There may be, there may be one that I'm not aware of it. Um, but um, I think the question is, what Chase are you bonding? About that. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think the question is, what are you bonding? You know, but mm -hmm. certainly there are. Um, they would be two different bonds. I, um, well, actually, we, we've actually talked about three. We've talked about a tree removal, an accidental tree removal bond, a stormwater mitigation, a bond, if there's any determination of, you know, an issue. Did, um, it was, it was Sean recommended. It was one of his things that he said definitely. Um, you should have some sort of bond. I just didn't know on a project what what his recommendation of would be for the amount of how much to, to bond. And then if there was damage to the roadway, so it would be a. Yeah, I thought about different. damage to the roadway because if we were getting, I was just thinking, you know, 400 truckloads of um, fill at, you know, 50. Um, 50 cubic yards. I would <coughs> anticipate that Highland Street is going to get pretty beat up, and it seems like it's already getting pretty beat up now. Um, so it's just going to get worse. So I don't know, even if you just pave up until the project. Well, they're going to have to dig <coughs> the sewer, right? We've got to well, cut the street up for yeah. the sewer. Yeah. Can, we have, can we require them at the end to put a final yeah. top coat? Paul, can you describe the forced main, where it goes, and um sure the, the force main starts in the service area uh at the site which is where i mean i can call the drawing if you want i can just talk you through it but um it then goes out the driveway and it goes along highland street uh to spafford and then it's there the is direction. a uh gravity brake manhole that goes in this stub on the on the uh last manhole on Spafford, but we'll, you know, we'll just go to that and we'll uh, put a gravity brake manhole, which was requested by the DEP, uh, DPW, and that's how it uh, <clears throat> makes sense. I can call it the plan if you want to look at it. And, and what is the intention of the off-site uh, work with regard to the roadway after you, you know, install the um, force main? Um, you know, at, at, at face value, it would just, I mean, it's a force main, so it's not a big pipe, okay? It's only like two inches. Um, you know, there will be other utility work in Highland Street to put the water in um, and underground electric and things like that. So, you know, there'll be some utility work in Highland and, and um, you know, I, I, at a minimum, we would do trench patches and if, you know, the, the amount of disturbed pavement warrants, you know, complete overlays for section of it, then, you know, that's something we can discuss. Right, so. At the end of the day, Highland Street would have to be restored to um, the standard de determined by DPW. Yeah. Is there a, you know, I, I is there a probably, a, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly, whatever DPW determines. Is there a commitment to do that anywhere? Only that, uh, only other than a, 
not specifically in here, but certainly a commitment to comply with all requirements of the TPW. <coughs> uh, we have to comply with every Excuse other me. every other town requirement. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that there is one necessarily. I, I think we should just think about that, yeah. Ned, so it's not a point that's debated later. Okay, great. What was said during the meeting, what wasn't. There's, there's a limit to where your work will take place on Highland. It's from what Paul described, it's no further than Spafford and in one direction, and it's no further than. I think it's uh -huh. probably right at the front door. Maybe. Well, uh, I mean, maybe so going, going north, we've got, um, you know, we, we're putting in a crosswalk. Yeah. So uh -huh. the northern limit on Highland Street would be at the crosswalk, which is, you know, heading towards 107. Um, right. And uh, then, yeah, up to, up to Spafford Road, and that's it. I mean, where does the water main come from, north or south, in relation to the entrance? Like towards Canton Ave or up towards Spafford? It, where, where, where's, where's the, the, the oh, direction the of flow right in the water main itself? I forget. Yeah, it's right on Highland, right? You're coming. You're just tapping off of Highland. Yeah, right? it's, it's so on so Highland it. Street. It runs yeah. under Highland, and we just, you know, tee off of it at the driveway. Right. <laughs> in my opinion, okay. is I think we should... Chase should get an, a, an opportunity to say how he wants that street restored. Right. And, and if, he, if he said, hey, I just want mm -hmm. the applicant to follow the standards, you know, mm -hmm. of, of trench cut and trench repair, then that's what it is. And if he says, boy, there's substantial disturbance mm -hmm. of the road, I'd like that section to be repaved, let's give him a chance to say, we, I just don't want to discuss it, debate it later. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I hear you. That's fine. Great. That, um... I, I, there's one I'd like to bring up related to what yep. you had mentioned. Yep. You were talking about, you know, stormwater, and we've had so much conversation about stormwater and the, you know, what's been said. Um, I inclusive of, and Sean's not here tonight, inclusive of Sean saying this design will work, right? So you don't have to tell me. I will tell you that he said that. Um, but you know, we've got neighbors that feel that they have a concern, they have an anxiety. Is there, how, how you know, how, is there any way um, to address that, you know, to pacify the concerns of the neighbors? Um, do you have any thoughts at all? You know, there's, as I know it, there's 22 homes on Spafford and you know, many have this concern that their condition is only going to get worse as a result of this development. Yet you have said that no, that won't happen. You know, we have designed something in compliance with the stormwater management system. Sean feels that way too. It has to go to DEP. DEP is going to render an opinion. But while all that has been said, and all that is either you know past us, or of course the DEP approval is ahead. Is is there? Is there something out there for the neighbors that the applicant would be willing to do? We'll put our heads, heads together and think about it. Um, from an initial perspective, we heard a lot of testimony about existing flooding of basements. Mm -hmm. How do you quantify what's different? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you then establish a right of a, a, re, a right of action, if you will, and where where the person making the assertion has to prove that there's been, you know, an increase in 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 infiltration to a basement. I I, I don't know how you so, I don't know how you start there. I will think about it. Mm -hmm. I just don't. This, this, this project don't is not going to affect basement water on Spafford Road. It just isn't. You know that is upgradient of um, of the site. It won't. And and you know we we've, we've designed this to, as I said, to meet the standards. And you know we've got climate change going on, as everyone's been talking about. And and um, you know I, I don't I don't I just don't see. It's not that you're not. I can say with confidence that we've designed this thing. You know do with the standard of care that's required for projects it complies with the rules we've done everything we're supposed to do you know all the standard practices we've run the models by you know accepted practices which have been scrutinized um 
and you know it will work okay now that to say that this will work and and to say that nobody along Highland Street is going to ever have stormwater problems again it's like those those are two different things and I don't know how you would separate the two yeah Paul I'm, I'm not I'm not going to say it it, it, it is easy to separate them um, but you just spend a little bit of time on Spafford right you see just I, I wouldn't say it's every home that's pumping water but an awful lot of them are so I, I understand and I'm, I appreciate why they're concerned yeah. I'm not know. I'm not debating that that's happening yeah the question is how do you establish a baseline against what I don't have compare a way next either. and I just don't know I don't, I don't know, know how you do that I don't know and, and I don't know how you <coughs> how anybody could reasonably ever ever prove that they were entitled to some level of compensation because there's been a change yeah. and I don't know how you do that I don't either Ned. that takes that takes engineers and whatnot. takes a lawsuit it, it yeah I mean it, I went it, through it yeah it might not be possible <laughs> but uh, well, you know as I said you 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 presented the issue we'll think about it and yep. I'll try to come up with something I just okay. I can't promise that I'll get there yeah. and I know you don't represent the hospital but the only thing that I could conclude is that the back parking lot in the hospital could possibly be running into the backyards of Spafford. I don't want to push it with the hospital, but I'm just wondering, is there a way to do some kind of a storm water study just to say, hey, is this water really running towards Spafford or running down towards Reedsdale? Well, we've done that. You have? Not you, but the hospital has done that? Well, I don't know what the hospital's done because their, their issues are, that's a different watershed than ours. Right. We know where our water is coming from. It's coming from up from Highland Street. It's coming from the properties above us on Highland Street. And it's coming from Winter Valley, the back of Winter Valley. And it's coming down through two intermittent streams, meeting together at a vernal pool and going off site through the stone wall and down through a channel to the town wetland. Okay. We're, we're below all those who claim to be affected by changes in, st in groundwater. You know, I don't think it's coming. I do believe that the, the two watershed theory, and I do believe that Highland Ave is a, is what was the, a drum one, and it splits the watershed. I get all that. I'm just... I mean, it, I mean Spafford Road from Highland Street goes up the hill and then down the hill. <clears throat> the top <throat> of that hill establishes which way the water goes. Got it. On one side, it goes down to our site, and the other side, it goes down to Reedsdale Road. That's just, that's fundamental laws of gravity. The only thing I'm thinking of is that if you look at the hospital rear parking lot, it does have the potential for the water to run out to the backyards of Spafford. And yeah, I understand that maybe 20 years ago there was a whole bunch of activity that went on between Spafford Road neighbors and the hospital. I don't know what the outcome of that was, um, but there were claims made that there were groundwater effects associated with some of the work that went into the hospital. I don't, that's all I, I'm, I'm anecdotally aware of that. I don't know anything more than that. Um, but I, 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 I mean, I don't know what we can do relative to what may be happening, happening at the hospital. All right, I do wanna. Yeah, um, can I just, just have one question about, yeah. um, since we've talked about Sean Reardon and our peer consultant, has he provided us like with his insurance of liability? Like, is he, since he is advising us if something were to go wrong, is he liable? I wonder. I would believe that that would be, should be on file with the town as a part of his contract. And Tim? But the responsible party is the, the uh, design engineer. So that's Paul. That would be Paul. Okay. All right, that's good. All right, given, um, it is 20 till, it's 10.40 right now. I think something that is really important, and not that I want to, um, I want to, we're going to have to, you know, talk about 20 through 24 as well. But um, construction materials, because as part of the special permit, the quality of construction materials is, um, is relevant. And so why we have, do we have the architect? Um, She's not here tonight. She's not here tonight. Okay. So I have some um, strong observations or concerns um, with some of the construction. 
the, um, the first materials of the, of the project, uh, back in the special, um, it's referred to the, the, out, the exterior siding as vinyl clabbered. And I, first of all, it is not, that's not sustainable materials. And I think it's a real inexpensive and, and a cheap look to what we're trying to create as a high quality um, project. You know, typically we've looked at clabbered, we've looked at other um, things that would be, um, again, low maintenance. We're not trying to add to, you know, maintenance and require real cedar shingles or, you know, we're trying to, but something, an alternative other, other than vinyl, um, I would ask the, the other members if there's materials that you would prefer to see as well. I like the hardy plank or mm -hmm. natural wood, but natural wood is just so difficult to paint. Right. Looking good. Right. Hardy plank's a great product. You can get a pre-finished generically fiber cement board, um, which is basically what the hardy plank, the hardy, hardy board is. Right. Yeah. And you know, not all fiber cement is of the same grade and quality. So you'd want to get the, the level that's a, um, like a higher density, like a higher cementitious content so that it has um, more durability. But that it can come pre-finished so that uh, the disadvantage of something like uh, a, a natural wood would be maintenance, I think. But the you know, fiber cement is used in the high density fiber cements used in commercial applications of, uh, regularly. Mm -hmm. So I do think it would, um, it's a more sustainable material, it has a different visual than the vinyl. And it's what was used at the Goddard School, for example, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, maybe not Which would not be quite the closest well. looking like actual real wood, the composite or the? They're both composite. I mean, both composite, but well, you a can hardy get plate. you can get it with the texture. Or you can get it smooth. You know, so even Hardy makes them both that way. Mm -hmm. um, vinyl doesn't come with that kind of a wood texture right. that you can get with the fiber cement. The problem is you're going to most likely do PVC trim. Right, that's what they have on here. Too. Yeah, I mean, you almost can't avoid that. Yeah. Something that is never going to look like real wood. You can dress it up with back bands and, and cornices and things right. like that. But, I mean, the hardy plank or, or a fiber cement um, product and the AZA or PPC trim is probably, you can make it look really nice, I, th I think. I mean, the, you know, the, nicer, the next nicest thing is real wood. And it's just I would so say either of those. It's so hard to maintain. No, and, and either of those options, I would. I would think would be fine. It's just the, a vinyl siding on a building, I just think is. This is the first time I've heard the term vinyl used in the course of this hearing. I wasn't aware that they were proposing. I didn't either. A vinyl. It was, I didn't realize until it was in your, the memo and it was describing. Um, I had not caught that because I, oh. I assume that builders don't even use vinyl siding anymore. I thought it was a sort of a 70s era that we're you away can, from. You can get so some decent vinyl siding. Okay. We're, yeah, it's, it's we'll not. Take, we'll take a look at that. I mean, that, I think, it needs to look right. Um, and the other thing that we were um, talking about is the windows and on the plans, and I was trying to look, the way the, way that, um, the sections are cut for the elevations, um, I don't want to have put Tim on the spot to pull up um, Elevations. I don't know if that's too inconvenient, but I couldn't find the site section that showed the right wing because when I asked for the, there had been some small windows off to the left side where there was um, sort of an office area. They put full size windows in there. Mm -hmm. I think there's small windows. When I was looking at one of the depictions, it's it did it showed smaller windows off to the right side when you would come around the driveway from the right side. And I just couldn't find that elevation. I don't know if we could. Look, we don't. We don't have to pull it up right now. But I just. I wanted to flag that because if you drive in, you have a beautiful entryway, divided, divided lights. The building's supposed to look consistent um, per our special permit, and 
if there's small a set of small windows off to the right, I think that's going to really throw off the, the look of the building. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and there was also an elevation where there's like six small windows. It was a sort of a random elevation, and I thought maybe we would want to revisit that to see why that was done the way it was, because it looks, it just looks odd on the building, because it's a very attractive building from the front, but there was just a, um, a site section that looked um, just like a bunch of small random windows, which, um, and I have large size elevations, but it was really that the front, especially when you come in the front drive, I just think that's really important. Um, well, there's different, there are elevations here which yeah. show small windows, but you have to go back and look at the that's plan, what's happening behind there, right. to see why that they're Off small the right. like that that's way. That's why I, I think would they're on, the on a sidewall or something, right? I think. It's not like you can get yeah. F-17. And then the windows that are on the off to the right wing, does it? Let do me you see, see that. The right wing. Look, looking at the front, yeah, there's the. There's two sections that I just wanted to make sure those had full size windows as well. Mm. And so that you could just, that could be a question for the architect since she's not here, that we would be consistent with full-size windows across the front and, and any sides that would be viewed from the drive. It'll, and then take, to, it'll take a little bit to sort that. And I guess, so. and also what type of, what window, we're assuming they're energy efficient, vinyl probably windows, but if there, there's a variety of, um, Qualities. I don't know if those specs were in there. What what style window they're using, Meredith? I, I grabbed those elevations. If oh, you, you want did. me to share. Oh, good. All right. All right. So it says vinyl slash fiberglass window, white with white trim, on the elevation sheet. All right. So. So Cheryl, what would the... Um, I'm trying to find the Q15. See, I guess this was the area that I was looking at. There's like six small windows there, which is random. I'd be on the right behind sheet. Sean. Is that behind? On F13. Oh, yeah. probably on bumps the right. out though, right? That, yeah, on the right. That little gable probably bumps out. Yeah, but those are on the first and second floor. That's like on the main floor. I just think that is odd looking for oh This area is odd looking. Um, <clears throat> this, I couldn't tell that was normal like full size windows. That area is odd. And I just, um, and then Cheryl, I don't know what the. F13 looks like, if you look at that plan on the right, it's on the, the if you go down, Meredith, with your pointer. Um, to the very right on the floor plan. Oh, down, yep. If you go over further to the right, that's calling out as F13. Nope, all the way over. The top right. Right up here. That facade, that last facade on the top right there is F13, which is the elevation you were just looking at. Yep, that. That one. So that looks to be um, in that corner on the yeah. upper right corner where those windows are. Right there. Those, if that's the case, yeah. <clears throat> those windows are below the level of a retaining wall. Two right. levels, but yeah, it's, then you'd have to go look at the plan and see what's happening in yeah, the plan that, in that room. Yeah, what, what's inside that? Um, and then the, what I was... That's where the loading door. 
Let's see what section. Would, this is our front entry right here. Yeah. So this area, the way that the way it's depicted, you can't really see a direct what this looks like. We changed those to full size windows here, but I'm concerned that these might have some of those odd looking windows here. So that would be L1, A403, mm -hmm. and L, yeah, it just in this, so L13, L10. I mean, because this is going to be really visible when you come in that front drive. Um, so 17, 13, 10, and 1. Is that possible to scroll to those, Tim? The um, L17? L17? Yeah, that's okay. a lot of little windows just, on it. Just go to A403. I'm just getting a note that some of those are bathroom windows. Yeah, it's typical. Okay. And those are on the back, so that's... So, yeah. Most of the bathrooms are interior on the floor plan I'm looking at. So L1, Probably no windows only. in the bathroom. So see, this is how, all right, <clears throat> this A1. So yeah, so here's the, the attractive front, and then you've got, is this visible on the front side, these two? L10. See how these are ran like they're just L10 on those. Um, I like to if she if the architect could look at those and just making full size windows, especially <clears throat> what's visible from the front drive. So these are I don't even, Cheryl, can you tell what the dimensions are on those windows? Uh, like how small I'm, not I'm looking at the floor plan though, like for some of these, it's, you know, these are studios, so there's a primary window on one wall, which is the big window, and then there's a smaller window on a side wall, and it could be that they're trying to minimize the impact on how you lay out furniture in these rooms because well, that's the, what if it's a bed wall but it's but, but if it's on the front of the building the front of the building mm -hmm. also has um staff areas mm -hmm. staff lounge a parlor um, office hair salons etc so which can you show me which elevation you were looking at again but in plan do you have, uh, it was the front wing, so it encompassed a few of these because it angled. L10. It was 1013. All right. And this one right yeah. here. So that's um, a side okay. window in a studio. So it's where the dresser and chair are shown in plan. So maybe if that, because that is visible from the front drive. That could be considered a <coughs> size window. And what's the, and is there another elevation you're looking at? L L one was one of them, wasn't it? L one. Yes. Yeah, L one. Yeah, just oh, to yeah. left. See the oh, yeah. Oh, in this right there. here. So all the way. Yeah. So it it looks like that what they have is one. Um, one uh, of the walls in the studio room has a large window, and if there's other windows in that studio that they're small, that's that's a bed wall. Um, mm -hmm. That one right there is a bed wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think anything visible from the front driveway should try to be a full size. We can look at that again closer, but I just wanted to, those were just a couple of things that I, mostly the materials of the, of the outside. Um, did anyone else have anything for the architect that we should 
uh, be taking note of uh, to maybe have answered for next time? I don't. That was, no, not for um, me. Yeah, it was just, uh, let's see. Special Sean, you mentioned you had 15 conditions. Do yeah. you want to share those with us? Yeah. Uh, I have some. We've already talked about some of them. Um, one I just talked about, which was water mitigation. Um, previously, we talked about sidewalks on Spafford Street. I think Ned had said no. Um, the applicant wouldn't do that. I'm not even sure that the neighbors want that. You know, some neighbors are in favor of it, some neighbors don't want it. Um, speed bumps, some form of traffic calming measures on Spafford Street. Um, a traffic mitigation fund we've already talked about. DEP approval is written in here. Um, I had a, a note for size reduction of building. I think the reality of it is, after talking about this last week and listening to Sean, where Sean describes most of the pervious area being roadway, parking lot, or that round, you know, paved surface in front, reducing the building size would be de minimis, you know, with respect to improving groundwater conditions. That's at least, you know, his takeaway from last week. Um, you know, I had a note about moving the delivery drive to the rear of the building, um, which is why I asked Ned about the traffic. You know, how often would a vehicle be going down the delivery drive? How many vehicles, days per week? Um, I find it to be less of an issue if it's 10 to 2, and it's 1 to 2 vehicles, and it's Monday to Friday. You know, I was concerned that there was going to be a lot of traffic and a lot of backup alarms and just be disturbing to the people that could hear it. Um, construction days, hours, you know, I, I still want to work through that. That's that's one. Um, uh, it, in some way, there could be another review by CONCOM, depending on what happens, I think, with DEP. You, you could end up back there again. So that's a condition I want to make sure that we, I think it's already written in here. Um, porous pavement of that upper parking lot, you, we talked about that. That was one. Um, oversight of construction, we've talked about that. Somehow that'll be captured here. Um, and that was, that was oversight of construction in terms of the practices of the site. The other one is oversight of construction of drainage systems, just to make sure that the stormwater management system is built properly. Um, I had noted the NIPTES permit, which there was some conversation about this previously, you know, stormwater runoff, but that's a standard. I don't think we have to write that. You're gonna be required to do that anyway. We also have uh, to do a SWIP. I'm sorry? We yeah. also have to do yep. a SWIP. Yep, exactly. Um, and then my last two were related. One was related to um, Milton Stormwater Bylaw Standards, which is written in here already. I think Ned has that in here. And uh, I, had, um, I had a note here, a landscape plan to be submitted for approval to CONCOM. You know, I, I think we talked about that at one point, but I don't That's know. That's a condition of the order of conditions. Okay. So those were the 15 that I had. Um, we've covered them in some ways. We've covered a lot of them. Okay, thanks. Um, Meredith, I did have one thing architecturally that I, yeah. I had neglected to add. Um, the zoning um, requirements and the design standards for the buildings require that the windows be either set into the facade or project out. Oftentimes windows are uh, flush and it provides for a, a very little relief in the facade. And the, I know there's lots of ins and outs in the massing here, but um, I would ask that the window detail be such that the window is set back from the face of the facade. And they don't have to necessarily provide a detail, but I'd like for that to be um, noted, at least in our conditions. What, shouldn't we have the specifications of the window style? Isn't that typically on the plan? Because it didn't, it just says white vinyl. Like a simulated divided light or? Well, normally, yeah, we, and we would just it have shows, the spec on what Yeah, I mean, it shows the, the operation, like some are awnings and some are double hungs. Um, but it's not specific to the brand or I think, style. Well, yeah, I, exactly. I think they're leaving themselves latitude. 
you know, to choose. They're going to want to price that out yeah, competitively. They, right. They, I understand. Yeah. yeah. And they, they probably have a preference um, to, to have the spec be open, and they mm -hmm. could go anywhere from a okay. Harvey to a Pella, an Anderson. You know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. assuming that's why they don't have anything picked. Right. But I we mean, would on expect that hand, to be a high quality window yeah, because I mean, on the one hand, not the a, thing about windows is that the sight lines or the, or the dimensions of the members can vary quite a bit, which can um, change, change the look. look. Yeah. So if we had one enlarged window with the dimensions of the sash members, et cetera, trim members, that way at least it, there can be some confirmation. Yeah. Um, when it comes through for the building permit that it, it's not significantly different than this because you know you can look at a beautiful rendering and it if yeah. it's it can be a lot different the way it gets executed is it possible now that the architect has it has what manufacturer they want to use for um, a window probably we'll have to check um, getting a note that says high quality window needs to meet thermal requirements in the code, so. Uh -huh. Well, high quality yeah, is, that, you know, Anderson windows. It's like, there could be a whole spectrum or I mean, Marvin I'm windows. Sure she's or, got, I'm sure she's got something in yeah. mind. We'll see what she She's could got. have something which is the basis of design. And so then that sets the baseline. And she, they can vary from that yeah. as long as it meets that same. And, you know, I've seen it where you say the basis of design in dimension and quality and in U value and so that you are not just leaving it open, but these sight line dimensions can be significantly different depending on the window. Is that something that we would want to put in um, subject to approval, a final decision of a window? Well, I think it, um, as long as, as, well as we have a basis of design that okay. that's adequate. And if you want to, I mean, if they send us what that spec is by email, we could, we can look it up. Uh, we'll be able to look, take a look at the example. Right. Okay. And the only other thing that I had too, just on that, is the, um, to have a dark colored enclosure for the trash area. I've seen some of this, um, Needham has a white plastic. It just looks, it looks cheap. Uh, to be honest. So something that's darker, maybe a material that's um, a little bit more um, substantial. Dark green to blend in with the trees would be nice. Um, it's going to be, on the, it's been moved to the back, which is much better, but um, a dark green or a darker color that is um, of a decent quality material for a closure. And I think that's what and under, oh, can we go on to affordable yeah. beds? Yes. I believe, yes. Sorry. Um, so there's no um, condition for, like, Milton residents? Should we have a condition, Milton residents? Cannot discriminate. Oh. You can't give Milton priority? I thought there was a preference. We I don't think, not did at one time talk about a, there a is not, There's no preference in the zoning for Milton residents. I believe we discussed a Well, I would say that this has um, been approved by the Affordable Housing Trust, so maybe a yeah. question to them about that would okay. be appropriate. Okay. Yeah, we had... We well, their definition of Milton resident is once you live here, then you're a resident. <laughs> so I don't necessarily agree with that definition. Okay. So I think a Milton resident is like someone who's here, maybe someone in the neighborhood, to is dealing with the impacts. There, you know. there are fair housing, you know, yeah. requirements. Yeah. I, um, there has been um, acceptance, I guess, at the state level of a Milton preference for a certain percentage. It yeah, wasn't it like seventy percent. But that's not. I did attend this um, webinar put out on by the, the AG's office that had. Part of it dealt with fair housing. They are um, concerned about that kind of provision in permits. Um, so I don't know how, if it applied to a, a memory care facility, how they view that, because what they were looking at was more just traditional housing on the other. Because um, again, this was sold you know, to town meeting as a, um, an amenity to Milton residents. So just trying to. <coughs> 
make and Northridge <coughs> definitely told us when we first started. I mean, I do remember very clearly saying, um, and there's folks here who talked about it. It says it, yeah, in all of our early um, applications. Yeah. So it's in special permit that you're on the website. Okay, that's great. Exactly, absolutely. absolutely. That's great. So, Ned, if we can look into sort of adding, somehow adding that, if, if it's appropriate. What does that mean if it's in the permit, but then it's not legal? Well, we need to find out before we put it in if it is, yeah. No, but like that's how it was sold, though, to get the permit, right? To get the bylaw passed. To get the article. I don't, I don't know I'm, who sold I that. I guess the I question... Didn't. Yeah, the practical side is typically residents are coming in and paying for a period of time if they run out of funds, they get priority to move into the affordable units. So we are trying to accommodate and support a family when they potentially run out of funds. The actual zoning says there shall be a preference for Milton residents for units, including the subsidized units, insofar as legally permissible. So that comes to the fair housing law. Okay. And our intention is to work with the town to solicit the Meredith, is, is someone speaking? Uh, we can't hear anything of what's going oh, on. Oh, yes. Sorry, that was oh, sorry. Uh, so, Jim Coughlin. He does not have a microphone. Um, with Jim, just Jim as the CEO of the the Northbridge communities um, is basically saying is that to the extent that it's, it's otherwise, it, as, as the bylaw says, to the extent that it's legal, there will, there will be a preference for Milton residents. Okay. So that could be put into Can add that, that, that uh, paragraph. Okay, good question. Um, commencement and completion of construction. Are we ready to go on to that? Or did we still have more with the affordable? I think that's been approved by the Affordable Housing Trust, so we should be good there. So, um, construction should be commenced within one year. Those deep, I'm fine with those dates. You all. Amendment, and these permits shall be, in, be amended. Substantial amendment shall be subject to the usual. Should they be required to um, check in with the neighbors um, and provide like a, an update? For amendments or for the construction? Or just for oh. during the whole, um, construction process so neighbors kind of know what's right. coming what you know and how long that phase mm -hmm. should last and maybe there's just one you know neighborhood representative they don't have to do everything yeah, that was actually Walcott Woods does did that and still does and I, that's worked nicely I think to keep people updated on what phase and the order of conditions it. provide requires look ahead schedules to be provided to the town we could certainly provide to a representative, to the, the designee well. of the neighborhood. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Did Walcott Woods do it with some kind of a website or just? It by email an email or? list, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can Seems reasonable. Not, I think could you do some kind of email blast to, to the residents or? <clears throat> It can be, it, it certainly can be done. Um, currently, when I file anything, I email it now because most of them are represented by counsel. I email it to the various attorneys who are involved, but for a while I was emailing it to a much broader list among the neighborhood. So it, it certainly can be done. It's a, it's, it's a simple thing to add or subtract a name to a. Sounds like a nice thing to do. 
Can, can I speak from a builder's perspective? This yes. will become the builder's burden. I think it'd be better to choose one designated representative mm -hmm. and have that person be the recipient and let them decide because otherwise it could be it could open up channels of communication that could become very difficult to manage so if the neighborhood has a designee um, my recommendation is just choose that person you know and they get submitted to the building inspector and also to whoever the neighborhood representative is and the neighborhood representative takes it from there sounds good It'd be a little easier to uh, Tim, can you scroll down to the last paragraph? Number 24. Just, I think it's uh, the words town planner. It should be the director of planning and community development. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Does, okay. does that recording recording have to go to the town clerk or just to Tim? What does it normally go, Ned? To the clerk the or to? Um, she stamps, well, she stamps it. No, so she, when, if there's a permit that's issued, yeah. it goes to the town clerk. Okay. It sits with the town clerk for 20 days to determine whether or not there's been any appeal. If there is no appeal, then it gets recorded at the Registry of Deeds, and then you make, you know, you provide a copy of the recorded document back to the town planner or to the conservation uh, agent um, as appropriate. Um, if there is an appeal, then nothing gets recorded until the appeal is resolved. Okay. So back to Tim. Yeah, I think in this case, Tim would be the appropriate okay. keeper of the record, either he or the, or the building commissioner, but presumably uh, the, the director of planning. Yeah, we, we don't typically have county recorded documents then go back to the town clerk. Um, you know, the, the, the county registry of deeds is like the, the super clerk. Right. Um, they've got everything. That's the official copy. <laughs> yep. All due respect to the town clerk, who is a super clerk. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Well cleaned up. Okay. Yeah. All right. So at this point, um, it's 11.15. I think this is a good time to continue um, the hearing. I don't know if, are you, would you like to, someone I like to? I just wanted to comment on one thing that was yeah. specifically discussed tonight. Yep, yes. So just, I understand they're doing some work to the landscaping possibly as a result of your comments tonight. So I just wanted to pass around, um, there was a question about what this looked like, this area now, and I actually happen to have a folder with a piece of paper in it that actually shows you. And it was at, it, it, it's quite contrary to, to the, um, what was on the screen. It's extremely sparse there. So that's what's there now. And I would specifically ask, I think I asked um, the last time the landscaping <sighs> was discussed, we'd really like to see when we drive up Spafford Road, it's the closest spot to that building is right there on Highland. It's not that long, beautiful entrance. We're looking at the side of the building right there in that area you're going to see in the picture. And I think a pretty big retaining wall. I know that retaining wall is 19 feet in some areas. So I would really ask that we slow down and be certain that we're going to be able to mitigate because we have this scenic road, beautiful residential neighborhood. And I wouldn't want to speculate about what plants are going to be able to cover this 19-foot retraining wall, especially since the landscape architect appears to be under the impression that it's a quite, um, uh, you know, green space, and it's really not the vast majority of the year. 
So I'll leave it at that, and we'll have additional comments. Okay. Can I ask, ask a question? Sure. This, this looks like it's further up Highland. Is, is that what residences are we looking at? Through I the think that's the, can I show it to you, Bart, because it was yeah, part that, of your that slideshow. Looks like, it looks to me like that's the Bacardi residence on yeah. the right side of the photo and the next residence up on the left side of the photo. Yep, so if so, you go up sort of across from, um, mm -hmm. uh, that's correct. If you go up this street, yeah. so if you're driving up Spafford, you see kind of the site in front of you and then the Bacardi residence and yeah. then over mm -hmm. that would be like the top of Buckingham. But isn't this further up the road than, than the site? This looks like it's further up the road to me. Well, it says adjacent to 137 front yard. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. I do, I, it is fairly sparse. It's not it doesn't Yeah, I'm yeah. that I could that's put in right now. Very sparse. That, uh, I'm not suggesting that yeah. I, but I'm just I, I guess okay. I look at that that's not the site the way I see it. That's up the road. That's in front of a car in front of I don't know who the next resident is. Hard to tell is. from that angle. I, yeah. But the Bacardi residence is right, you know, so it's mm. snug up to the site. So Yeah, as I look at that, if you look at that again, Manette, it yeah. doesn't it looks like it's from in front of Bacardi and in front of the residence to the left. The condition where yeah. you're describing so might, be just li might be just like might be just like it. What you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So this is Highland here. They're both Highland. Right? This is Highland. And that's the Bacardi residence right there. And this is from, I guess, regardless. It's, <laughs> well, I, I, the it's only the reason, the reason it's, well, the reason it's important is it's yeah. further up the road. It's not in front of the site. It's further up yeah. the road. Uh, you look at it, Ned. I, 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 you know, it doesn't look like it's to me. That's pretty much the site. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, like. Okay. Adjacent to 107 to 111. I mean, if you go and look. You're going to build in front of the Bacardi residence then? Well, do you know the well, Bacardi Yes, 25 yeah. feet away. Yeah. I, I, I understand yeah. that. That looks like it's It looks, like it's, house on the map, it looks so. like it's right in front of it. It looks like it's going to be built it's in the front yard. Yeah, well, that's pretty much yeah. um, Can I just make one comment about landscaping? In the zoning, we did talk about it. Do you want to hold the microphone? Oh, sorry. Yep, sorry. Hi, sorry. <laughs> Teresa O'Brien, 42 Spafford. We did talk about trees and landscaping a lot. And one of the things was 20 foot trees to be planted. And tonight, it didn't sound like there's many 20 foot trees planted. So that's in the zoning. It's section H that all trees should be 20 feet tall. And if the wall's 19 feet, it'd be great if we could get more of the 20 foot trees because we did talk about, I'm sure you remember, that was a lot of zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I can send you a picture from my deck. That looks better. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. OK. All right. So at the same point, oh, sorry. Yep. Bart. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yep. Bart, I reside 11 Spafford Road. Could I just ask, will we have a chance to speak at the next hearing, yes. or how would, how would you like to handle that? Yes, you will have a chance to speak at the next hearing. Okay, so I'll save my comments. I think just to, um, I think probably what, what Manette, uh, my, my neighbor, was trying to express is that for significant parts of the year, that's sort of what you see, even though that is, that is the neighbor. You know, it's, it's, uh, that's, it's very sparse in, in, the, in the winter, and so that's why the evergreen plantings are so important. Um, but our concern is, of course, that they don't really do well in the, in the wet area. So um, to the extent that you know, more evergreens can be planted in the, in, the, in the upland, the problem with that is, as you know, they're building on almost every square inch of the property. So it's hard to plant a lot of evergreens. Um, and so what we're facing is that the majority of the year you're looking at 19-foot retaining industrial-grade retaining walls that are not um, really cohesive with that spot, that site, the neighborhood, the town. Um, so yeah, I, I'll leave it at that. But I think that's that's part of the concern. And if you look in the wetland area, even on the, some of those Google Street images, there's a kind of a a, a gap where there's just dead trees because nothing really grows. The tall trees are, are further back, and then there yeah there are a few young saplings in the front, but there's just all Japanese knotweed in the more uh, recent pictures. So. Um, it is quite remarkable the difference between summer and winter. Um, but, but thank you. I'll, I'll thank you. hopefully have some time to give yes, more absolutely. expansive comments. Yes, this thank is you. going to be continued. So, great. Okay. Um, 
So with that, was there anything else from the board before we have a motion to continue the public hearing? Meredith, we do have Nadine Hanna with her hand up on the Zoom. Okay. Nadine, if you would need to speak tonight, but you will have a chance on the 24th as well. Hi, Meredith. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Nadine Hanna, 11 Stafford Road. Thanks, Tim, for noting that my hand was up. Um, the photo album that I was unable to show um, last week, just due to the time that it was submitted, um, beautifully labeled Bacardi 2.0. As I had mentioned, I was award, uh, afforded the opportunity to walk um, the private resident side of the property line multiple times over the course of many recent significant rainstorm events. Um, quite a bit of those albums, if you have a chance to review them, will show you all of the standing and moving water throughout the adjacent properties. Um, but also, I do take pictures from Bacardi uh, property line all the way um, pass down towards the entrance on the Highland line, um, you know, past the driveway and showing that stable or barn or, you know, whatever else we have on, on the farther side of, of the proposed site. And you will see the scarcity of plantings and of trees. I and mean, there, there are trees and they're not talking about removing the trees up at the Highland line. Um, but it would kind of show that whether the angle of the picture that Manette was showing was, you know, directed towards Bacardi or not, does, it, it's irrelevant because a lot of the screen, quote unquote, screen currently at street side is, is you know, dried reeds and so on. So um, I do beg you guys to take a look at that. I, I'm not asking to prevent, present it right now, but um, it does show the entire street side view, you know, pick by pick. So. Um, that and, you know, just one comment um, from something that was said earlier, it, it does still sound like no matter what happens um, contractually between the proposed site and their vendors, it'd be much like the hospital and, and the current vendors where really the onus and the burden of proof of, of you know, how people are operating, what streets they're using will still come down to the residents locally and that would really be those of us on Stafford Road. Um, so I don't really hear anything different. And in fact, I heard quite a bit tonight of much the same and, and the same was the answer of no to, to so much of what you had asked um, of them and their legal counsel. And so uh, once again, thank you for everything. Um, but just let's all really be cognizant of the fact that they had a site, uh, excuse me, they had a build, they had a business that they wanted to put in Milton. And this is just the location that they're going to try to wedge it into. Um, they already had, you know, the, the scale of it, the scope of it mapped out from a business perspective and, and everything else either checks their boxes or it doesn't. So it's really, you're our last line of defense. We appreciate you. Um, I don't really believe that they're going to bring it down any much in size or or impact and the traffic situation will only get worse and um and the you can do to help combat that we appreciate so thanks once again please look at those pictures and uh have a great night thank you thank you thank you all right so with that can I vote can I vote so feedback on and to you. That's me giving feedback. A motion to continue the public hearing for 111 Highland Street. Um, um, Meredith, we've got Diane Agostino with her hand up in the Zoom. Okay. Do one more comment before we. Welcome, Diane. Good evening. Sorry to be so late, but no. it was the first time I heard about the 19 foot retaining wall. And I just wanted to present tonight the concern or the request that the planning board look into um, the issue that a 19 foot retaining wall may have being built on that particular site. In fact, a quick review of the building code, very quick review uh, that I can provide to you all later, mentions that a superintendent may have to, um, I was trying to read it to you, may have to review and investigate the soil. As we know, if you 
a general retaining wall um, would require about a two to four foot footing uh, to make sure that it's supported. And I understand there is some um, mechanism that they're suggested, which would not require going into the earth because most likely they would run into water. So I hope um, you will review this with the building inspector to understand what the code requirements are because if pilings are required to be put in to have a 19 foot high retaining wall, that would be something that you would definitely want to determine um, any impact to the whole area by having pilings put on. Um, I'm not an engineer, but I did quickly look at the building code and I would suggest that you um, gather additional information knowing that under that land is water so that pilings would have to go way down to get firm footing um, for a 19 foot tall retaining wall to be safe. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing on this um, um, permit and your uh, requirements. Appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. So can I just make a comment about the, you know, one thing about these ready block and other uh, manufacturers of these products, like Paul mentioned before, they engineer them. So it's the final design is not going to be um, a, something that we see. So I guess one of the conditions that we could put in is if it's, um, if the uh, design ends up being substantially different than that, what has been submitted to us in the in the uh, in these drawings that it come back to us so for example if it splays or if it has to have multiple steps or i don't know what the engineer will come up with for that for any of these walls but we already talked about some changes we wanted to see in the in the type of wall sean thanks yeah. for sending that product it looks like it's a much better product so hopefully they can take a look at that and uh, take a look at not having the wall come so high because you're not using it as a curb uh, and so instead of it being 19, maybe it's 17, uh, or, um, you know, all of these things will have, make a difference. So I, I just wanted to um, suggest that we consider that as a condition as well, that once it's engineered, if it's substantially different than what we've seen, it comes back to us. Ned, one thing that would be helpful, there's not that many top of wall, bottom of wall, denoted elevations you know we can we Jim found the 19 foot because there is a location near there do you think Paul could help us and just give us a few more you know locations along there where he denotes top and bottom <coughs> so we can see what kind of wall exposure we have we know we have 19 feet I'm not sure how long we have 19 feet there may not be a lot of 19 foot high wall but you know what I'm saying sure. yeah. yeah he could draw an okay. elevation of it honestly he, he could he could do that too yeah and just, just so we could see a much better idea yeah. of the visual impact of it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could be 19 feet, Ned, for just a really short, that inside part of the radius. I don't know. But it'd be helpful. Understood. So I'll make a motion to continue the hearing for 111 Highland Street Special Permit to April 24th at 7.05. Great. Second? Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much, you. everyone. And that's right. fully remote. That's yes, fully remote. remote. It's fully, it's on Zoom, <laughs> fully remote, because the school committee's meeting that night, so we're, yep, I'll be online. Thank you. Um, I'll let everybody step out and while they do. Um, we have old business on the agenda, but at this point, I feel that it might be a good time to, you know, uh, unless people want to get into this, um, I, I think all of this could wait till Wednesday. If we have time on Wednesday. Make a motion. Sure. Sounds like a motion so to adjourn to me. If there, I'll make a motion like to adjourn. A second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank all you. Opposed?